what I want to talk about is the world that we live in today and what that, the implications of that are for the, the, the teaching that we do in the classroom. So if you could just take 13 seconds and look at these. And, and I simply want to ask you this. Think a little bit about what they all have in common. Now, chances are you were looking at the first four and you thought, well, there are issues. And then you got the election, and you're like, well, I don't know how to feel about that. And then you got the education, and you thought, well, that's not really an issue or a problem, right? But actually, I am going to say that what all of these have in common is that they're particular, obviously, they're problems we're facing today, but they're particular kinds of intractable, difficult to solve problems. Um, I came across uh, uh, a gentleman named Edmund Coe, who was an uh, engineer when I was working in Hong Kong on a Fulbright, and he talked about the, the kinds of wicked problems that an engineer faced. And he defined them by saying that they're a wicked problem as opposed to a tame problem. A wicked problem is constantly shifting. The dynamics are in flux. Things are moving. Um, they're resistant to resolution. Sometimes the resolution that you use the time before doesn't work this time around. You have data that's incomplete or data that's contradictory. Um, sometimes the problems themselves are difficult to recognize. So if you go back and look at this previous slide, you know, the 2016 election, no models saw it coming quite like that. You know, obviously Nate Silver said it's only 81% chance that Hillary will be, so there's a 19% chance, 19 out of 100 models will predict um, uh, that, that, that uh, Trump will win, but nobody saw it coming. Right? It was happening and we didn't even know it. Zika virus is very similar. The Zika virus existed for 30 years before it actually evidenced itself in South America. And then when it came to North America, we didn't know how it was transmitted, what the consequences would be, um, what kinds of environments uh, 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 the mosquito that carried it lived in. And so a wicked problem is a problem that's, it, it's, it's a problem where basically you've got to do something, but Traditional logics and traditional ways of approaching things just aren't going to work. But you've got to do something, right? You know, you've got to change a wheel on the bicycle as you're riding the bicycle down a hill very quickly. Um, and the point uh, that, that my friend Edmund Coe made about this, talking about engineers, he said if engineers are going to face wicked problems, they need to have wicked competencies. And my response to that was, if all of our students are going to face wicked problems, and they are, all of our students need to have wicked competencies. Think as well about the wicked workplace, right? You know, new technologies, new markets, new clientele. What are the consequences of, of, of trade with China? 20 years ago, we thought, man, look at the size of that market. What could go wrong? Well, OK. <laughs> um, new regulations. I have a friend who works with uh, um, um, uh, opening, uh, beginning, setting up new IPOs. And she, uh, she says every time they go to the SEC, they follow the protocol, they follow the instructions. They go to the SEC and the SEC's on oh, the change, <laughs> new regulations. So you gotta shift, you gotta adapt. Um, new challenges of every kind. Um, and think about this too, students don't always get the jobs they want, nor do they go into the fields that they study. Or do they stay in the fields that they study, right? We know that, um, you know, they're 22 or 25 or they're 35, but they graduate, they want to get a job, they get a job, they get that job, and they're in there for five years, and they're thinking, hmm, I wonder what else is out there. I wonder if this is really me. We know that 50% of teachers uh, drop out in the first three years. We know that's a similarly high number for nursing. Um, and even if they go into the jobs that they study for, they're not going to stay in the positions that they're the entry level. Or at least if we've done our job, well, they won't, right? They'll move up. So my friend Kurt, who's an architect, you know, began drawing um, uh, blueprints. And that was wicked enough because the technology and the software they were using constantly changed. So he constantly had to adapt to that. But then he got promoted, and all of a sudden he had to manage the entire office. Well, that's not something they taught him in architecture school, business management. And then he got promoted again, and suddenly he was dealing with hiring and firing and accounting. And then he got promoted again, and now he's a partner of the company, and his everything has changed. So as they rise up, different skill sets are required. The, the dynamics are changing. They have to pivot. They have to shift. Um, and then I'd like to point this out, too, about the workplace. <laughs> you know, here are our students. It's handy, right? Oh, I'm in my English class now. OK, so you, you can make me write. Oh, but now I'm in my math class. You can't make me write. <laughs> you know, this isn't an English class, right? There are rules. 
Well, they get into the workplace. It doesn't work like that. My father was a Lutheran minister. Geez, you know, theology was like one twentieth of what he did, right? And then there was counseling, and everything just blurs together on a given day. So, point being. Students are moving into a wicked world. They're moving into a complex world. They're moving into a world that we are only so capable of preparing them for because we can only give them, as you pointed out, so much information. And then the information changes. Our fields grow. Knowledge expands. The dynamics, how we behave and don't behave with one another, change. Um, so the question, what does it take to live in a wicked world? I'm going to posit the answer. Wicked students. <laughs> Wicked students are open to new challenges because life is going to be nothing but for all practical purposes. They approach those challenges in a deliberate and thoughtful way, not just problem, I'm going to react. They step back, they pause, they think. They're able to draw from multiple areas because, as we pointed out, most of the problems we're dealing with, I mean, is immigration a political problem or a social problem or an educational problem or um, an educational problem? I mean, how, how do these things work? And they're able to adapt ideas and technologies and data from one area to another so that even if they studied computer science, now they suddenly find themselves doing human resources, they can think about what they learned over here and they can think, okay, it's not the exact same problem, but how can I shift it? Oh, that didn't work. So last thing, they're not afraid to fail and try again. I tried that. What can I do? How can I readjust? How can I move forward again? Because this is the kind of world that they're going to live in. All right? So then another question, because I like questions. <laughs> We're academics. This is what we do, right? <laughs> um, what does it take to create a wicked student? Well, the traditional answer is pretty simple. You give them content knowledge and you give them skill knowledge and they're good. Now, content knowledge and skill knowledge matters, matters, matters. So don't, if anything else that I say really upsets you, don't claim that I, content matters. We need to cover content. Content is how students encounter new information, new ideas, absorb it, learn nuance, move from novice to expert. And we want them, to, we need them to do that. Okay, um, But if this were enough, we would be fine. And we're not fine because every day employers, you know, students move into the world, they get hired for new jobs, and their employers say, and there's a brand new AAC and new Heart Research Associates study out, the employer says, you know, about 33% are where we need them to be for entry level. And it's less than that for promotion level. So if, we were, if this were it, we'd be good. I'm going to argue that it takes more than that. Here's what I'm going to say. It takes content knowledge. It takes skills. But it also takes something else. If I'm going to walk into the world or walk into a room or walk into my office or walk into a particular work week or walk into a new project encountering something I've never seen before, I need to have content knowledge. I need to have skill knowledge. But I also need to have a sense of my ability to approach that problem. And that's not easy to come by. Now, because that phrase isn't you know, nice and pithy, I actually try to use this term authority. What we need to do is not just give students content, knowledge, and skills, but we need to give them a sense of authority. Now, I want to very quickly say this, and this is really important. Here's what I don't mean by authority, <laughs> OK? I don't mean authoritarian. I don't mean bossy. I don't mean arrogant. I don't mean dominant. You'll notice I don't even mean confident, right? Are you confident you can fix this problem? Yes, I am. Well, I guess I was wrong. <laughs> you know, I mean, confidence is not enough. All right? Um, same with efficacy, self-efficacy. Do you think you can solve this problem? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I can. Um, nope, guess I couldn't. You know? So um, agency isn't even really enough. I, you know, I like agency, but a six-year-old in the cereal aisle of a grocery store has agency. And if you don't believe me, I can introduce you to my kids. <laughs> so, um, so here's what I do mean by authority. I mean authority in this context, it draws from experience. It builds off of skills. It has to be earned. So another way to think about it is that content and skills create authority. Okay? As a student acquires information, they learn. And that helps move them, helps move them towards authority. 
Okay? My friend Eric Amsel, who teaches mathematics, I'm going to use an example from him uh, later from at Weaver State in Utah. He also says authority, another way to think about it is authority, or it's authority over content, content and skills. You've mastered it to some degree. You have it under your belt. You need content and skills. Okay? But in addition to that, I mean, the reason that I use the term authority, I come from English, I come from a writing background, is that authority also relates to the idea of authorship of creating something new, of moving forward, of moving beyond just how things are. Because if students are going to be interacting with a world that's complex and throwing challenges at them that they haven't seen before, they're going to need to not just have content and skills, but they're going to need to produce something new, some new way of innovating, of moving beyond, of moving forward, of creating something that didn't exist before as a means of responding to this issue, to this problem. So think about it this way. Authority relates to content and skills, but it also moves forward. It's creating something. It's innovating. It's developing. I like that idea. I, you know, there's a, um, Marsha Baxter Magolda talks about self-authorship, where students learn to construct their own identity, right? Not the identity that their parents or their friends or the religious groups or communities give to them. So self-authorship. And in my mind, this is sort of like world authorship. I want our students, all of our students, to be able to move into the world and create something, add something to it, make something more. How do you get there? Well, I think some people get authority by going into the military. I think some of our students come to college and they've got authority because they were in 4-H and geez, if you can raise a cow, <laughs> you know, and then sell it and then figure out how to do the, the, the accounts and all that stuff, that's pretty good. I think uh, some students have jobs and they gain authority through that. I have a student named Shala, her brother when she was 14 years old uh, was diagnosed with cancer. She basically raised herself because her parents had to take care of her younger brother. She has authority. She's got it. I think some people have it for good reasons when they come to college already. I think some people have it for reasons I'm not so sure I'm comfortable with when they come to college. I spoke to a donor once, a guy who had in, was a billionaire with a B, and his father had been a billionaire also with a B. <laughs> and when I explained this concept of authority, he looked at me and said, no, you either have that or you don't. Oh, actually, you should have seen his girlfriend. She did not look happy. <laughs> so I didn't, I, you know. So yeah, he went home on a Learjet, but I'm not sure it was a smooth ride. <laughs> so anyhow, um, the, the major point I think I'm going to make about authority is that authority can't be told. It can't be lectured. A person can't walk in the room and say, here's authority, and if you only grab it, you're going to get it. You'll be fine, you know. Authority has to be, it has to be learned. And I'll take it a step further, and I just noticed this today, and this is another tweet that I had, but did you, has anybody ever noticed this? Le learned and earned are almost the same word, it's just one has an L and the other one doesn't. And the, the, see, this is why I call myself a geek, because this delighted me, and I thought, oh my God, <laughs> you know, you're such, my kids are like, oh, geez, dad, shut up. <laughs> so, so anyhow, it's got to be earned. In other words, um, students need to be placed in situations where they have to assume authority. They have to, whether it's raising a cow, or um, being in the military and running a regiment, or um, you know, having a job. But they have to do it repeatedly. It can't be once. It has to happen multiple times. Um, with increasing independence, you know, that it's maybe they get some structure at the beginning, but then they're increasingly, no, you, you need to take care of this now. It's your job. And in contexts where failure is an option, because failure has to happen in order for people to learn. Okay. Um, something came out just the other day that said that uh, the optimal result for learning on an exam is 85%. They ran tests with AI. And if a per if, if, in a situation where a person has to move forward, where they're being pushed to the point where they have to think more, not just what I know, but more, they're going to get about an 85% on that exam. And I thought that was intriguing. So losing something, missing something is important. Okay. 
What does this look like? Well, okay, I'll give you the first three points. Repetition, increasing independence, learn through mistakes. I'm gonna add two additional points to this, and these come from the work of uh, Randy Bass, who's at uh, Georgetown. Um, he does a lot of work with e-portfolios and that sort of thing. And he says, um, students actually have to make meaning. And this is that idea of authorship again. You have to go beyond, you have to add something, you have to create something new. Maybe it's a completely new program. Uh, maybe it's a completely different way of thinking about how to approach programming. Maybe it's a different form of poetry, you know. Um, um, so, but they have to go beyond. They have to go beyond what they know, where they're comfortable, into someplace else. And they have to do it in context of uncertainty, where there isn't a clear answer. And again, what we're talking about here is reality, but what we're talking about is sort of bringing reality into the classroom, changing the dynamics of the classroom so that the answers aren't at the back of the book, or even the professor maybe isn't looking for the answer, but for the process. How is your mind working? Um, because in many ways, you know, <laughs> you know, what is the right answer for um, uh, when the Gulf Horizon exploded? Well, fixing it, but nobody knew what that was along the way, so they were going to have to try multiple things. Okay. So I'm going to explore three different ways that this can come into play. I'm going to talk about day-to-day -day teaching. I'm going to talk about papers and projects and that sort of thing. And then I'm going to talk about exams. I kind of like the exam section. It's fun. I like to think about that. But um, these are sort of small practices, small changes you can make um, in the classroom where on a daily basis a student walks in and maybe they've read the textbook. Maybe they haven't. <laughs> maybe they've watched a film. Who's, whose project is that? Or maybe they haven't. Where you, yeah. Where are, yeah, there, right, good. Um, maybe they haven't, so what do you do? Um, but what do you do so that when they're working in the classroom, they're not just getting some mastery over the content and skills, but they're getting used to this idea that I need to step forward, I need to do something more. So, let me give you an example from computer science. That's very simple. Um, in class, go over a particular programming skill or idea or approach or concept related to creating apps, development of apps. Um, in class, have students practice those problems maybe even collaboratively. But then eventually, also in class, um, because it, you don't want them to have them turn it in on their paper because they're gonna think then that there's a right or wrong answer and they can leave the classroom, but you can and, and go, maybe go find it. But also in class, ask for something that requires them to go skills plus. Here's what I taught you, A, B, and C. Work with A, B, and C in your group. Oh, hey, look, here's the very last problem. Let's talk about this. And maybe what they do, at the beginning of the class, as in the beginning of the semester, is they'll spend time in a group looking at that skills plus question, that, that, the, the question that pushes them one step or three steps further, and talk about, well, how might we approach this? And maybe towards the end of the semester, they're not gonna say, how might we approach this? They're gonna say, here's the skills plus problem. Take a shot. Everybody has 10 minutes, then we'll reconvene and talk, okay? Uh, nurse practitioner, very similar. In class, go over a set of diagnoses. <laughs> um, in class, students practice skills, uh, you know, uh, diagnoses as their problems or situations or case studies that, that engage that set of diagnoses and then push it one step further, you know? I mean, it's funny how um, <clears throat> oftentimes the most resistant students I will find to this idea of wicked problems and not having right answers are the pre-meds, you know? I just. I've learned it this way, and I'm very good at doing it this way. And you're like, what do you think is going to happen when you walk? I mean, have you ever had a doctor's appointment? <laughs> you know, my doctor, my doctor is like, well, it could be this, it could be this, and it could be this. So what do you want to try? This, this, or this, you know? That's how he goes. Um, sometimes it is clear, but sometimes it's not. Um, geoscience, my friend Chris Connors. Uh, talks a little bit about this. Early on in his semester, he will give students uh, rock samples, data sets, and ask them for a mining recommendation or a drilling recommendation. And the early samples will have pretty, some pretty clear answers and minimal noise, which is uh, you know, the detritus, the data that doesn't really mean anything, right? Um, middle data sets will have moderate noise but then multiple reasonable solutions that the student could take, but they still have to find the solution. Later data sets, more noise than not, and every path out towards a recommendation or has to be constructed whole cloth by the student from nothing. And you could have 25 students in the class with 25 different recommendations. Or maybe they arrive at the same conclusion, but they get there in different ways. Physics. I had a... Um, 
a faculty member talking about this yesterday. She said uh, she, she wanted students to take more responsibility in the classroom, so she had each student come in and do a problem for the rest of the class on the board. And the students didn't like it. Part of my response is that whether they like it or not isn't really the point. But, but I got the point that she, she said it just didn't seem to work. So here's what I suggest. Students choose a problem on a given day. You know ahead of time. Maybe, maybe it's two students a day for two problems, or maybe you've got three students going, or one student a day, whatever. And you talk ahead of time. You know what problem they're going to do. They walk in, and rather than giving the perfect answer, <coughs> they give three feasible reasonable ways, ways that you could actually solve that problem. And then what they do is they lead a discussion of the class about which one of those three we should choose. The focus changes. It's not about the right answer. It's about the multiplicity of approaches and talking about which of those approaches might be better or might not and having a debate about it. Somebody I saw, there were notes, somebody's slides were flicking through, talking about metacognition. Who's is that yours? Okay, good. This is metacognition, right? They're not, they're not solving the problem, they're talking about how to solve the problem. And that's what professors do. And so they're adopting the authority of a, the, the teacher. Another example, mathematics. Um, I mentioned my friend Eric Amsel earlier. He works with uh, what are called double deficit students, students who come to college with below, with remedial skills in mathematics and re remedial skills in writing. Um, what he does, and he's just got, received an NSF grant for doing this, is he has those students, of all things, go teach primary school students. <laughs> you know? I, when I was in graduate school, I took three qualifying exams. Each of them was a weekend long. I picked up the exam Friday morning at 8. I dropped it off Monday at 4 o'clock. You know, you would think that that would prepare me as an academic liter literary scholar. Nothing prepared me like having to walk into a room at 25 <laughs> undergraduates and say, okay, this is Victorian literature and this is how it works. And we all know that from our own experience. The minute we have to explain it to somebody else, then we own it, then we got it. So this is brilliant in my mind. Uh, similar example, maybe they can't actually get into the classroom or get into tutoring, so will you have them write problems or solutions for the students? Because that's a complex skill to have. What are some good, what would, what would the sample problems be and then what would the actual problem be? What are the solutions, what complications? How does it demonstrate the skill that we're focusing on right now? Patrick Balls, uh, B-A-H-L-S, he has a, uh, students write exams for their own classes, exam questions, you know? And so what they're doing is they're thinking about what makes a good question. And in order to do that, they have to master kind of from the inside out the mathematical skill that's being discussed. All right, uh, history, four mini essays where students come to, uh, they're in groups, they come to class with a, a question about a particular artifact, they solve that question in a group, they write a mini essay worth 5%, and then they do it individually worth 25%. Um, interpersonal communications, this is a colleague of mine, she just gave a presentation yesterday that I really liked. Um, she, uh, what she does is the students come in uh, a week ahead of time, they send her an email and say, this concept next week, Tuesday, I'm going to do, there's five concepts in the class, I'm going to do this one. And then they meet with her 48 hours ahead of time. If they don't make either of those benchmarks, they just fail the assignment. Um, and they come in and they say, here's the activity that I want students in this class to do in order to demonstrate uh, the concept. And then what she does is she actually leads the discussion after the fact. So the students, they don't have to worry about the discussion, they don't have to worry about what it takes to ask a good question, leading it, because that's a whole different skill set. They just have to think, this concept, which I'm seeing in words, but I want them to enact in reality, how can I bring that to life? And when a student does that, shifts from one genre or modality to another, that's when they're owning the information. That's when it really becomes something that they're mastering. So another example, oh. oh no, it's a project. I'll show you a project in a moment that gives another example of it. Another example of that though would be my friend um, D.B. Poli, who teaches um, biology, and she has students, she wants them to get the concept of DNA to RNA. Are, is anybody a biologist in the room? Okay, I don't even know what that means. Do I have that more or less right? <laughs> Is that kind of, okay, good. Um, so she has them create a cartoon for a non-biologist so that 
the non-biologist will understand it. So it changes from written form, conceptual form in the head to visual form, and then you've got to explain it to somebody else. So interesting, right? To do that, you have to really know the materials. Thinking about papers, projects, I probably have too many examples on this, but let me throw a couple at you. Um, literature. Give them an assignment where the business department is changing their major, and uh, your job in this class is to explain to the business department why poetry should be taught in the class. Why do business majors need poetry? Okay. Now, a couple things I really love about this. It can apply to any department. <laughs> you could do it anywhere, right? But it asks students to take information from one context to another context and think about how and why it works. To think about the conceptual skills that may overlap, but also to think what it might bring to a different field. I also like the fact, frankly, that it's possible, you know, I've got students in my, uh, I might have a, a, a business major in my poetry class and looking and going, you know, I don't care about poetry. I still don't care about poetry. And part of me is like, okay, you still have to do the assignment, which, and here's why, because in today's world, the ability to step into a different perspective and occupy that and think about it from the inside out, oh my God, we need that so badly, right? In so many different ways. So this asks them to approach a field in ways that they wouldn't before. Um, art history. It's just that one little tweak, right? If it could be about death, it would be easy. But it can't be, because guess what? <laughs> Grief is much more complicated than just the initial death. So where can we go beyond it? How can you think about these things? How can you think about the ways art functions? How can you think about the way something functions in one setting and may have one purpose, but might work in another setting in a different way? Another art class. Here's what I like about this. There's a couple things. One, this is actually, the course is actually not just art, it's community murals, so it's a more appropriate uh, content, but one, I like the fact that it puts uh, an art student in the context of something going budget, math, community, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, recognizing that the real work of an artist actually engages more than just the creation of the art. The other thing I really like about this, it's a first year seminar. First year seminar, right from the beginning, they have to take on these big questions and big ways of thinking about how art functions. This is a, that's a real one, by the way, from um, Wesley College in, in uh, Dover, Delaware. Um, and then here's the one I was thinking about earlier. I like this one. It's from my friend Tony Weiss down at Tulane. Hey, economists in the room? Yeah, okay. I don't, yeah, again, I don't even know what modes of production are. <laughs> so, but I like, I like the idea that it's an abstract concept that they have to somehow turn into a physical form in a way that's going to communicate effectively to um, students in a beginning class. And not just, um, so they're moving, they're translating information and owning that information along the way. So thinking about exams, I already told you this is my favorite area. Um, you know, yes, we need to test in our classes that they have mastered the content, they've done the reading, they've watched the videos, they've, they've been part of the conversations. But surely there's room to test these other things, synthesizing, pulling things together, making meaning, uh, dealing with uncertainty, particularly since you can't do meaning making in a class unless you know the content of that class. You can't synthesize ideas within a class unless you know the ideas in the class. Right? So somewhere on the exam is a room for a question like this. Because in life, it's not about you reading over and over and over again poetry or literature that you've read before and can identify. It's about you encountering new works and being able to sift your way through that. Um, art history does a lot of this. Here's a painting you've never seen before. And what I love about it is when an art historian, not only um, do they show them a painting they've never seen before, they might show them a painting by an artist they've never encountered before. And they might show them a painting by an artist they've never encountered uh, before from a completely different era. <laughs> so the student's looking at the painting, trying to, trying to analyze how it fits into realism, and it's not realistic at all. 
So it's not about the answer, it's about their ability to process, to figure out, to see, to deal with anomalies, to deal with uncertainty, to deal with those moments of mental conflict where you're like, what the heck? How am I gonna make sense out of this? Then there's this one, probably inappropriate, but. <laughs> but I, you know, this, here again, you can apply this to pretty much any field, right? Um, and, it's, it, and, and what I like about it is that the kind of work they're doing, they still have to read. They're still doing literary exegesis. None of that's changed. The kinds of work they're doing are the exact same kinds of work. They're just doing it in a different way. And there's no right answer. I'm actually going to guess. I mean, the fact is, is that William Wordsworth was very tall. He was 5'10", which is unusual for that period. But Ezra Pound had so much anger in him that I'm pretty sure that Pound would win, right? <laughs> you know? so, but you know, they don't necessarily know that. So. Well, if you look at some of the poetry that was very conservative. Yeah. 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 I got, the, I got the impression reading Pound, he wasn't a guy I'd want to hang out with. No. Yeah, there's never any question. But uh, frankly, down T.S. Eliot, I feel a little more sympathy towards, yeah. you know, but I'm still not sure I wanted to hang out too much. <laughs> so, <laughs> biology, phys physiology, you know, argue for or against the feasibility of a flying horse. Again, there's not a right answer here, but show me how your brain works. And in order to show me how your brain works, you have to have mastered the concepts and the, the information from the course. Um, evolutionary, evolutionary psychology? Not a right answer, but show me. You can't answer that without knowing the content of the course. So, so three different ways. What do we do in the classroom? If we're going into a wicked world where there's uncertainty, the content is crucial, but so is the attitude, the sense, I can do this, I'm not afraid of this, and we need to make sure that that sense of, I'm not afraid of this, I can do this, is not just the A students, or the older students, or the rich students, but all of the students. Um, because who knows when you're gonna have a C student running the country, for instance. Um, <laughs> so, but here's the interesting thing. They, they also, when they do this kind of application and working through things, they're actually learning the content more deeply. They're applying it in complicated ways. They have to think about it or conceptualize it in complicated ways. And in order to do that, they're going to remember it. It's going to be written into the neuronal networks much more effectively than simply, here's content, hand it back to me on the exam, which only purpose is memorizing it for the exam, and then it disappears. But also, they're going to walk out with a sense of their ability. I can move into the world. I have the right to move into the world in powerful ways to engage these problems. So, Thank you very much. I appreciate your patience and your attention. <laughs> other thoughts, other questions? I don't want to belabor anything. I know we have some very good presentations coming up. Is that, no? Okay. Um, so hi, so thank you very much. I actually scribbled down two assignments that I'm going to use this Oh, semester, good, excellent, so yeah, yeah. Really appreciate that. And one of them is really, I, I teach entrepreneurship, and one of the assignments would be related to that. I think this would be really, really helpful cool. in that regard. Good. The other one I just wanted to share because I think a lot of us might be able to benefit from it. So um, I have online discussions using Blackboard, right? Right. So the students have to read a chapter and then answer some questions and then discuss about it. But I love the idea of then having them like be assigned, You're, you, know, you, you sign up for one of those and then it's your job to come in and explain this, you know, to synthesize the discussion right. to the class and maybe include some problem solving piece of that too. Right. Just starting to think right. about it. So thank you. Yeah, I good, thank you. Thank, I appreciate that. Yeah, the, the, the physics example that I gave earlier, the key to that is because they're asked to bring in multiple approaches, this is basically design theory, right? You know, don't take one approach, take multiple approaches. It shifts the purpose, which allows them to think not just about the content and about right and wrong, but beyond that. So yeah, good. I'm glad to hear that. Good, good. The uh, hand went up over here. I don't want to. Um, OK. Oh. Mike, please. Over here. <laughs> um, can you go back to the Wordsworth slide? Uh, sure. Everybody. So um, I'm looking at am I going to get in trouble? I mean, in, in the past, they put these videos up on uh, up on the internet, so every, the whole world is going to see my words worth drunken bar <laughs> example. Go ahead. I'm looking at your book, what I got, which I got a copy of this morning, and I'm just wondering, 
what a rubric for assessing this assignment would look like and what students would know about how this assignment would be assessed as they complete it? That's a good, that's a great question. Okay, is your background English? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. So, what you begin with is by saying, what would a good answer look like? What would be the components that would be in a good answer? Well, a good answer, well, I say here, it's got to have literary analysis, and it's got to have um, their, their uh, extra literary writing, so the writing they did about writing. So there's going to be two things. They've got to have good literary analysis. So this is me building the left side of the rubric. And by the way, I'm not a, a huge rubric person. Okay, um, but I think it's an interesting exercise to think about what you're looking for. So first one's gonna be careful literary analysis and then you've got what really bad literary analysis looks like and really excellent literary analysis looks like and everything in between. And then you've got their ability to analyze the, the extra, uh, extra literary views. Then what else? What else would be there? What else would be important for answering this question? Well, can you analyze literature? Sure. Can you analyze theory? Okay. What else? Well, you'd have to remember the poems that you read by the people you were going to support. Yeah. So content and evidentiary accuracy, that would be a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, the, the fourth area I would put, the final one would be how do you draw your conclusions? What's the logic you're using to make the claim? You could add a fifth one about history and context. I don't know, what do you think? Would you add anything else? Look at me being a teacher. <laughs> so. When you said, I'm not a big person. Mm -hmm. When you said, <laughs> when you said I'm not a big rubric person, right. uh, I was immediately skeptical because I think the rubric is the thing that tells the students how they're going to be assessed fairly yep. and yep. Yep. what they actually have to do yeah. with the prompt. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'll tell you what. Um, I, I don't feel strongly enough about this that I go to war or I write about it. I mean, there, there are two or three rubrics in the back of the book, right? So um, I'm looking at yeah, them right now. You're looking at them, yeah. And they're not bad, I will say. Just give the mic to somebody else. <laughs> so, um, there, there, for me, there are two things um, that, that drive my thinking on this. One, or three things really. The first one again is just to restate, I find the creation of a rubric a very powerful dynamic because it's a, the instructor articulating to him or herself exactly what they're looking for. Even better, it's faculty creating a rubric together to articulate to each other what it is that they're looking for. Um, in terms of my, my, um, uh, my wariness of rubrics, um, one of them is just simply uh, a brilliant student of mine named Uni from the Baltimore area. She's of Jamaican descent. And um, uh, but actually, the second point is, if you're going to give them a rubric and tell them your papers, your work is going to be evaluated based upon this, you, something, they have to then do something with the rubric. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of words on the page. Right. They have to go inside, maybe when they're doing peer response, my friend Hannah Robbins, and I love this, she's a mathematician. When her students do oral presentations, she gives two oral presentations, one good, one bad, and then the students design the rubric for the oral presentations. That's brilliant, because that's authoritative. Um, but I just had this moment with a student, Uni, who I adore. She just just in my office earlier this week. She's not one of my advisors anymore, but I, I wanted to use a rubric. So I was doing paper conferences, and so I had the rubric sitting on the desk, and so we would do the paper conference. And at the end, I would say, you know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with rubrics, and this is a preliminary one, but if you would, if, if I were to assess your paper right now, you'd be kind of here or here, or where would you think you would be here or here or here? And when I got to Uni, I said, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with rubrics. And she goes, well, I know I'm more than what's in those little boxes. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> so I took him and I was just like, <laughs> so, but that's probably convenient for me, right? It allows me to do something that I'm not comfortable with anyhow, and I don't know that it's good practice. I'll be frank about that, you know, and I think everybody has to. I mean, one of the points I always make, and I, this is not a workshop, so I'm not going to make it necessarily, but one of the points I always make is always for any pedagogy, pedagogical approach, you have to adapt it to who you are as a teacher, who you want to be as a teacher. You have to then push the envelope for yourself and you have to adjust when you fail because it will fail. And it's very easy to go, oh, this is 
stupid. I can't believe we did it and throw it away. But that's not legit, right? I mean, we, if we're asking our students to try again, if as scientists we know we try again, if as scholars we know we try again, we need to do it with teaching as well. So, does that make sense? Yeah, I feel like I've just gone public with a dirty little secret. <laughs> Oh my, oh, my name is Paul and I don't like rubrics, <laughs> so. Well, can, I, <laughs> Please. can I add to that? Because I think uh, going with your way of thinking before you confessed uh -huh. about um, you're not using rubrics all the time, I also think that uh, it's appropriate to have rubrics in a course where there's a standardized curriculum. Yeah. You know, for example, so we're teaching composition and yeah. students need to be able to do certain things yeah. that they'll be judged in their subsequent classes on whether they know how to yeah. do that or not. Yeah. But I think particularly talking about something like literature mm -hmm. or psychology or sociology, I mm -hmm. even find this. If I have a rubric, then again, I get somewhat formulaic work. Mm -hmm. And I like to be surprised mm -hmm. by students. Mm -hmm. And so I can give you an example. I never presented this scenario. But I've had students answer questions instead of writing a paragraph or something mm -hmm. where they wrote what was a uh, hypothetical interview mm -hmm. or pretending to be the person right. and um, revealing something right. you know, in a memoir or writing an answer in the form of a poem, right. which showed right. that they understood yeah. all of these things, yeah. but they also put something else of themselves into it yeah. that was beyond the normal... Yeah. Yeah. expectations, yeah. and so you're right, it's very difficult because you have to be able to account, mm -hmm. if you are evaluating it, mm -hmm. how much mm -hmm. value you're according to mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that occasionally I do, because students sometimes come in and they want me to tell them, this is exactly what to do, mm -hmm. and that's not what I'm teaching literature for. I want to help yeah. them understand yeah. why people derive pleasure yeah. from reading, yeah. and to be open to just trying to read lots of different things. Yeah. Yeah. And then from there, they can do what they want with it. They yeah. might just be entertained, they might be educated, they might yeah. be challenged, they might yeah. work through their personal problems, whatever. Yeah. But um, after a while, students will get with it because, as you said, yeah. there's not high risk, there's lots of activities they get to do. But the other is that I'll provide them examples of stu work that students did in previous semesters uh -huh. that's not with the same piece of reading. Uh -huh. It's not exactly the same question. Uh -huh. So instead of saying there's no right or wrong, yeah. because I find if I say, well, there's no wrong, yeah. some students will give me whatever yeah. easy yeah. answer yeah. they can, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I teach no creative writing. <laughs> you know, right, so, yeah. as opposed to, I yeah. really want them to go out there yeah. beyond yeah. outside the box to think. And yeah. so, in showing them what some students did in response to yeah. a prompt or a question, yeah. that gets their creative juices flowing in some ways. Yeah. And for students who are not particularly creative, mm -hmm. I'll give them occasionally an opportunity to work with someone else mm -hmm. so they share their strengths. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. that's just you know, some things that I've enjoyed doing that are more along your lines. Yeah. Than and I, I mean, if anything, I really, I mean, the example I used from my, my colleague Hannah Robbins. So I'm actually, the irony of this is on uh, Wednesday next week at the Association of American Colleges and Universities uh, conference. Um, on Wednesday morning, I'm doing a workshop on, guess what? <laughs> Rubrics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but what they did is they called me and they said, listen, we want you to do a workshop, but we, but we want you to deal with it. They said, here's a provocative idea. What would happen if we turned these rubrics, these leaps, over to the students? And I thought, OK, yeah, I'll try that. I'll give that a try. So one last question, I guess? OK. OK, two? OK, right. good. I'm yeah. going to move away from Ezra Pound okay. and Wardsworth to the social sciences. I teach anthropology and the cornerstone of my class has always been getting students to do participant observation. Right. And I think one of the, the best things that I've learned over the years as an instructor is they have a section of the paper where they can kind of say, where did it go wrong, right? Where yeah. did it go wrong? And yeah. sometimes the paper where they're actually describing the culture information they got is not so wonderful. And then you get to that yeah. and you realize they got it, yeah. right? They didn't yeah. get the result, but they yeah. got it. And I yeah. think that, you know, trying to encourage them to think about the process for them yeah. is really pretty essential. Well, and it's funny, right? Because, you know, that quote about the beautiful problems and engaging the things that, that what we love as scholars, what gets us going is when we find something that doesn't make sense. 
that's neither nor that's contradictory. And um, Kathy Takayama, who's a biologist at Brown University, says, you know what, as scholars, it's those liminal spaces that are kind of in between that we know are rich. That's where our best thinking and work comes from. And she says, and we also know that, you know, I mean, I'm at a very traditional college, 18 to 22, most of our students, it's different here, I know. But we also know that oftentimes when our students come to us, they're in between. You know, for me, they're in between childhood and adulthood. For you, they might be in between jobs or in between countries. They're in a liminal space. And what do we do for four years or two years or three years? We push them out and tell them we want the right answer, you know? No, the goal should be to help them use the richness of that liminal space. So, okay, I think I've gone way over. I apologize for that. Thank you very much. Great job. I'm Leah Allen, and I teach biology at the Rockville campus. And my presentation is going to be a little bit different from the others because I'm the only slacker without data. What happened was in the spring, we developed projects that we were supposed to implement in our classes this fall. But as you're going to see in a minute, I ran into an issue where I couldn't teach the class that I had developed a project for over the summer. So we had to change gears. So my initial project was targeted at non-majors biology, uh, bio 101. In this course, one of the goals is to get students to appreciate scientific information. And by the end of the course, they're choosing a scientific article that they're going to summarize and they're going to do a little presentation on for the rest of us. The only problem is when I ask them, even with its very strict guidelines, right, step by step, here's how you find a good article with, with fact-based information, not opinion. Often, I get articles that run the gamut. Some, like you can see here, just total garbage, right? So, <laughs> and there's an approval process, but that makes the approval process very lengthy and uh, traumatic for some of my students. So, my goal with my initial project was to do web quests starting in the first week of class where the students would be looking at various websites and having to assess in groups the utility of the information there. Is it a blog from Joe Schmo that happens to not believe in GMOs? Or is it something from a real scientific uh, fact-based website? But, like I said, I had to change gears. And the reason why is because we had a problem over the summer. I teach anatomy and physiology as well, and I'm one of the course coordinators from that. Well. Before summer one ever began, the problem, like I said, it was a good problem, was that we had too many students that wanted to take anatomy one at the Rockville campus. In fact, we had so many students, we could have filled a whole other class if only we'd had this space. So I talked with my dean about how to, how to fix this problem in the future. And we decided it was a good idea to develop a fully online Human Anatomy 1 course, not hybrid, lecture and lab online. And yeah, that's a challenge. That is a challenge, but I use a lot of technology in my classes, so I felt like it was doable, even if it meant having to rework my plan. So as I was thinking about creating this course, I thought back and reflected on a lot of the things that we had learned in set, and man, did we learn a lot. This is only a handful of what we studied. We studied evidence-based techniques that improve student success in courses. And I can't tell you that any one specific book here inspired me, but there were some common themes. One being to get your students to care about the information in your class, and to do that by making the information active and engaging, giving them real-world problems. Two, create a sense of community in your class. One where they're comfortable with sharing ideas, which isn't always easy to do. And I felt like that might be an extra challenge in an online format where, let's be real, if you've ever looked at reviews for any business, right, they're, <laughs> they're either really great or awful. So, <laughs> 
I decided to take this information and use it to address three main concerns with this online course that I was developing. I have a bunch of lecture videos that are pre-recorded from previous semesters, over 20 hours worth of video of me teaching. But I don't want the students to passively watch it. I don't want them to watch it like they're watching a movie, right? They should be active with the information. Two, I do want to develop that sense of community with this online course. The students are gonna be there with their computer a lot of the time. I want them to have a sense that they're not just there alone with their computer. They have help from me and they have help from the other students. And while I'm doing that, I want to help them develop a growth mindset, which is something that I want in all of my classes anyway. So to address these main concerns, I developed basically two ends to my project. One, I reviewed those over 20 hours worth of video and I popped them into a new program. I, they usually are on YouTube. Now they're in Edpuzzle, which luckily enough, Candon um, introduced us to that program at the start of the fall. The thing I like about this program is it allows the instructor to incorporate graded questions that the students have to answer as they're going through the video. So they can't just passively listen. They have to stop, they have to think, and that question's going to be graded, so they better have been paying attention and taking notes as they were watching that video. So that's one part. The other part, to develop a sense of community and a growth mindset, I wanted to develop some, some skills related to metacognition. So like a positive uh, metacognitive cycle, if you will. So first thing I want the students to do is I want them to create a plan for how they're going to study. Then they need to be actively assessing how well that's going. They need to be monitoring what they're doing with their study habits and are they getting anything out of that time. Then they'll evaluate it later after they've taken a test. And how am I gonna do this? Well, with the discussion board. So traditionally at MC, when we're teaching an online class, the discussion boards are the place where we have the fact-based questions. I moved those out into another program which freed up space in the discussion board. to develop metacognition. So, beginning on day one, on day one, the students are focused on how they're going to study for this course. They get tips from me about what they need to be doing, and it's intense. It's going to be over the summer. I usually see them four days a week, four hours each day, not to mention the study time outside of class. So, and, and you know, in addition to all this language from me, as you can see, I've incorporated videos from other sources. So, from previous nursing students, they're now in their careers, what worked. And from authors that we studied in SAT. And then they're going to go on the discussion board and they're going to report to me and their peers about their plan, and they're going to give each other feedback encouraging positive feedback on their plans. After that, they'll be monitoring their progress in two ways, one with a muddiest point modification, basically, where they're going to tell us each week what was the most confusing thing in lecture and lab, why they thought it was confusing, and if they found anything to help themselves clarify that point. If they didn't, that's okay. That's why they're weighing in with their peers. Hopefully somebody else has a fix if they didn't find one. They also will be monitoring their progress by reflecting on how well their plan's going. Are they, um, are they falling behind with that timing? If so, what are they going to change to fix it? And after they take their first test, they'll be evaluating similarly. What's working, what's not, and if it's not working, how are they going to fix it? 
Over the course of the summer, I'll be assessing how this is working uh, with a couple of different means. One, I'm going to give the students surveys at the middle of the semester and at the end to see how they felt about Ed Puzzle questions, the video questions, and these discussion boards. I also want to see if there's any correlation between how they performed on the video-based questions and um, on their exams. And this would be a, a little bit harder to do because we don't have as many fully online courses. But in a perfect world, I, what I hope I can do, I need to talk with my dean more about this, is compare the DFW rates in this course to other fully online biology courses. And thank you all. I need to hand this off to Joanne now because I'm right at the 10 minute mark. My name's Joanne Carl. I teach in broadcast media production. These are my students in these, with these, well, not the <laughs> students running the cameras here. I can be very proud of them. Um, I forgot my little clicker, sorry. Um, I had a similar uh, experience with everything not going as planned, which is really a good exercise in uh, learning, I think. And so um, I wanted to just go over how it worked with me. Um, but first, uh, I had a couple of guiding quotes, and these came from some of the literature that we read, which was just awesome. Not just to read, but within that cohort to discuss what we read um, really helped us to learn from one another and to, and to solidify what we were reading. One of my favorite things was that what students want. They want to be intrigued, they want to generate their own ideas, um, and they want to voice their opinions. So I hear a lot of that when you teach journalism. I say as many times as I can, there's no opinions in journalism. <laughs> but a way to take your opinion but find facts that support and also find other people's opinions to include them. So I thought that was really important, particularly for our students. And the next one was because I, f I feel like there's a little bit of an overemphasis on active learning for the sake of active learning. And I loved that it talks about, um, we place the brunt of our instructional design efforts towards building thinking skills and cognitive growth sort of do something active in order to make sure that you're working on that cognitive growth part. So I think that was really important. So here's, I teach, um, the idea of the cohort was to uh, set something up in the fall that you would then implement in the spring. But as you can see, I teach different courses in the spring from the fall. So I uh, planned for a uh, fall course that also had a little trouble and it just didn't run. So I had made a plan for that. So I adapted and switched. Um, the original course was a 200 level capstone course. And so it was very different because what I changed to was an intro course with those skills and the facts that they need to know. So it, um, but it really worked out well. I mean, I was proud that it worked out well with what I did. So um, my strategy was to use PowerPoints. Well, that's an old thing, right? Except the PowerPoints are a guide. They, um, sometimes that PowerPoint would sit on the screen for a half hour while we discussed it. Sometimes the PowerPoint would be projected on the whiteboard so that students would then fill in the blanks on the whiteboard or do their own thing. We'll see a little example of that. So it was partially to guide a, as a lesson plan, partially a reference because those PowerPoints or pieces of them could be uploaded, um, partially reminders, and you'll see an example of that. But a lot of it was designed to just support engagement. Um, and nobody thinks of PowerPoints as engaging, but they, uh, that was my uh, challenge there, okay? So um, I went to, uh, this is an example. So on the first day of advanced broadcast journalism, um, I showed the students what they'd be doing on the last day of advanced broadcast journalism. They'd be producing a live newscast. They'd be in the studio, they'd be directing, like Cody there directing. I don't know if any of you guys made this one. Um, but they, um, so they would see and put themselves in the roles that they would be in. But before they could do this, they would have to create the content for that newscast. So on the first day, we talked about meaningful content and remembered what they had learned in all the prerequisite courses. So this is one of those slides that sits up on the screen for a half hour while you talk about what did you remember from this course about visuals? What do you remember from this course about your target audience? What do you remember about what is newsworthy? And I'm sure that they could all repeat that right now because we drill that into them. Um, 
and then also it's a reminder. So some, I, this one I printed out and I'd hand them to people right as they were about to take out a camera and say, you need to remember, be sure you get good sound, all of those things, the things that I want in their ear as they're out there working with a, a highly technical camera like this, remembering the things they needed to remember. So that was sort of a reminder. And then it, uh, I could take what we're doing on Thursday, I could say, here's what we're gonna do Friday. We have a four hour lab. Here's what we're gonna do, so be prepared for this. That could also be screenshotted and put on Blackboard as an announcement so they really know what's happening that Friday. So that's one course. Uh, so I've tried, the, tried um, working with these engaging PowerPoints in several classes so I would be ready in the fall to work with the, uh, the new class. Um, so this is a broadcast management class. This one is one of those typical PowerPoints just full of information. Information they needed for a discussion board. So they could go back to that, refer to that, and then and, and bring all of those important facts into it. Um, also, we talked about, a lot about time management in this um, broadcast management class. This is one that you would project onto the screen, onto the whiteboard. Uh, one student gets a time, is asked to be timer. Um, two students come up and get mar markers, and, one, and the first student writes out the, the phrase, switch tasking is a thief, and then writes the numbers one to 22. And that's easy, and, they t and we write the time on the board. And then the second student writes S1, W2, I, 3, you know, they have to write the, go between letter and numbers, and then write the time just to illustrate how hard it is to go from one thing to the other very quickly. And in time management, that's something, and for students who are, um, you know, juggling a lot of courses, that's a really important thing to know. Um, so that's one way of using it for active learning. And then we also spent a lot of time with that, discussing why the differences between multitasking and switch tasking. So that's just sort of examples. So then when it came to actually um, taking this engagement strategy and working with it, the course was um, VT, uh, TVRA 140 video editing. Um, and I used it every single First, on the first day of every week, we used a PowerPoint. The second day that we met usually was a lab, more of a lab, but um, it was very easy to give them a recap of what was happening. Um, you can see that some things uh, they are gonna be, what they will be learning um, with a little bit of fun with icons. Um, and then the final slide always included the homework. Um, and also one thing I learned from our, my cohort from Bruce was to be giving them um, in class mini quizzes very brief, but they would be a PowerPoint mini quiz uh, up on the PowerPoint that they could either write down the answers or I tried a, different, a lot of different modalities for these mini quizzes. Could they all log into Blackboard and do a mini quiz? That worked mostly, you know, so I tried a lot of different things on those. Um, and so that really helped it with the adapted plan. Uh, it also really helped it with some of the things, concepts that are harder, that really need some illustration. So I can describe to them and give them a very specific dis uh, definition of what keyframing is, for example, but I also could give them. Uh, um, uh, it would lead me to my lead my lecture to the demo. So I would give a definition, show this, and then immediately shut down PowerPoint and go to an in-class demo of what that is using the software, the video editing software that they would be using. So I spent a lot of time going from PowerPoint to software to standing in front of them in the whiteboard to PowerPoint to software and then for them coming up and standing and doing things with the whiteboard. So the, it really helped to lead that. It, did, it wasn't just PowerPoint, it really helped to lead that. So uh, it came time to assess that plan and we had determined ahead of time what the assessment would be. And this course is very hands-on, it has only uh, midterm. And after midterm, they're really um, assessed by their pro final projects. So there's not another test with points after that because they need to know all of these uh, ter the terminology and skills, and then they apply those skills um, in the second half of class. So my assessment plan was compare midterm scores to the previous four sections, um, and to compare rubric scores for the final videos, and to then reflect on all of those, uh, the anecdotal and formative assessments. So the midterm scores didn't improve, <laughs> and I'm not sure why. But I was a little disappointed, but then I, real, I was surprised because I felt like it was going so well, right? And I realized um, there might be a couple things I could do differently. They were just exactly the same. Um, and so, and it may have been that this was a little different class. I noted that four students dropped after midterm. There were family issues that like we see quite often. 
Um, so, but that assessment really did help me to look to, um, for the future, to make sure that I either take that test and relate it more to what we've gone over or to go over things more that are going into the test. There might be something I can tweak, which is a really good thing to, um, to figure out. Um, the final projects, um, it, this is a little, I was gonna show a video, but we don't really have much time of the final projects. And I don't know if I can even do that from here, because it's on there. But what I did get, I really wanna be able to pause it and everything, so I'm not sure if I can do that. Um, what I will say about the final projects and the rubrics, they did bet the students who stayed in the class, their final project scores were higher than they had ever been before. Um, more than that, their final projects were much more thoughtful. My, the final projects in video editing, an example would be uh, the night I went out to uh, trick-or-treating or, you know, sort of good videos for an intro class, but not as thoughtful. Whereas this semester, one final was, um, was from a, Peru, uh, a Brazilian student, and it was um, all in Portuguese, but it, w but it really talked about the political situation there, and it had some music involved, and it was just a, a much higher level. One was a student who was very shy at the beginning, and his final project was called Life Hacks, and it was how to not sleep in class, or how to, you know, all really cute things, you know, and, um, and the third one that I really enjoyed was a student who came in uh, and I, my impression of him was rough, tough guy, right? Well, his final project was about a program for um, diabetics that um, can is, uh, limit the number of finger, finger sticks. And it was educational, but he did it in a gym with basketball and, you know, that kind of thing. So I got a lot deeper meaning in the video projects, just not what I wanted on the point score. But I find that as a win. So thank you very much for listening. My name is John Colleton. I'm a business faculty member at the Rockville campus. And I had an opportunity to use, uh, oh, there, she has her coat on. Oh, no. <laughs> I was going to talk all about how great e-portfolios are, but she's not listening to me. Um, and using e-portfolios uh, to, pro OK. OK. Look, e-portfolios, I, I mentioned it, okay. Um, yeah, and SMART goals to achieve uh, a higher level of engagement, hopefully with the students. Um, we started this semester by asking the students to develop two or three SMART goals and at the same time create an e-portfolio to post those where they could then um, up, provide updates in the middle of the semester and then at the end of the semester identify were they successful, and also reflect on the process itself. Um, just to remind all of you, SMART goals are specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-bound. We began the uh, second week of the semester talking about this. I asked uh, the standard classes to create two SMART goals, the <laughs> honor section to create three SMART goals, and then we the second week of class, developed a rubric together, all of us, on what was an appropriate SMART goal. How do we know that it's specific or measurable or attainable and whatnot? And how do we know what a good one is from a bad one? Third week of class, they've posted these goals. I had a chance to meet individually with each student in my office to discuss the goals uh, at the suggestion of Professor Nake, excellent idea and um, talk about is it going to achieve the, you know, what they're hoping to achieve. Um, when they weren't meeting with me, they had already been assigned their international business uh, group project, so they were off to working in groups developing that project. S the college has an e-portfolio project team, and part of what they promote is a website that uh, introduces WordPress. The advantage of WordPress is it's still here after my class is over. And it's still here after they graduate from Montgomery College. So they can actually take this with them wherever they go. Um, it, uh, the college pro e-portfolio project team also provides uh, boilerplate content, a basic structure, 
uh, guidelines, even little videos on how this stuff works, as well as a Blackboard community for faculty that includes things like rubrics and schedules for a semester. How would you incorporate uh, e-portfolio? So there's a lot of support available for faculty interested in that step. You will end up with a, if you follow their template, a kind of a standard layout, including navigation about welcome and about me and my goals and my coursework. So I provided to the students a template that said, from my coursework, I want you to create a BSAD 101 page that then links to your goals. And this graphic also identifies the timing at the beginning of the semester, mid-semester, and end of the semester, so they knew how to organize their data and when it was expected to be posted. Following that, um, I had uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 28 students, a Monday, Wednesday, 29 students, and a Tuesday, Thursday honors section with 11. So I had a chance to try this uh, in a variety of different classes, fortunately. Because when it came to assessment, of course, we are a very quantitative driven, numbers driven, show me the data kind of community these days. So I wanted to make sure I had some numbers that I could point to. Uh, specifically, I hoped 80% of the students after they posted their SMART goals would have at least three of the five elements identified at an acceptable level. Well, the green boxes are at an acceptable level, the yellow boxes need some work, the red boxes, they just don't have a clue. The important thing here are the blue bars. Those are people who didn't turn in anything at all, and there were students that just didn't post anything at all. Well, my goal was 80%, and indeed I was able to hit 81%, so I felt that that was successful in just getting the goals posted. Following that, at midterms, I asked them to not only uh, provide an update, are they likely to achieve those goals, but what evidence do they have to support that update? And again, green is good, red is bad. I'm getting more and more of those blue bars, students that are just not participating. Um, even though there are significant points attached to it, they still just didn't seem to get the work done. Um, but I was able to hit 77%, so I hit the numbers. They're made up numbers, but I hit them, so that's good. <laughs> um, third part, 70% of either accurately evaluating their level of success or using specific and relevant evidence or providing meaningful self-reflection on how it affected their learning. Did they hit two out of these three? And sure enough, they did. Fortunately, I did have three classes because the very first class, you'll notice lots and lots of blue bars. And I was really concerned as I was grading this first group of students, like, oh my God, what have I done? Have I, you know, are they committing suicide or something? But it actually turned out to be somewhat of an anomaly. It was just that particular class that seemed to have the issue. So I hit my numbers, 79%, which is good. I like numbers, but frankly, I like words better. So when I asked the students, what kind of goals do you have? Some of the sample goals I got were, oh, I want to speak at least, I speak in class at least once every class, which was kind of cool. I like that. Um, I had a student who said, I'm going to write my speech in my notebook and reread it and reread it and reread it until it's stuck in my head. So, okay, you know, if, if that makes him more comfortable as a presenter, that's great. Um, I had uh, one gentleman say, I'm going to define my role in the team and what am I responsible for, which I appreciate because there's a big group project as part of this class. But of all of these, my favorite was the young lady who was going to teach the seven main concepts of business to her little brother and then quiz him. She had a 13-question quiz to see if he got it or not. I thought that was a great goal. Um, well, did they do it? In the, the re evaluations, things like, well, I've, I picked up a planner. I've never done that before. And I've been more organized. I'm glad to hear that. Um, our group has been in touch, and we worked great as a group. I wish we had done a few more group assignments. In 30 years of teaching, I have never had a student ask for more group projects. This is the only time I've ever seen that. So clearly, uh, he felt that this helped him be effective at, in the group. Um, one student said I took notes while I was reading the book, and it helped. 
And gee, if I knew it worked this well, I would have started doing this my first semester. <laughs> so, um, and, and you know, not all of them are great. One of them was, you know what? I just want to get an A. That's it, you know, uh, really. If you look at this, all my classes, I just want to get an A. So, you know, we don't reach everybody, but hopefully we re reached a few. Um, reading business made me interested and more motivated in being a business major. Um, and this one forced me to go to a place where I would not be distracted by noise. And it turns out that place is the library. And if you go to the library, then you can apply this not only to our class, to, but to other classes and be more productive. Uh, and finally, it helped me not just succeed in this class, but um, in all of my classes. So if you had really good students last semester, you're welcome. <laughs> it worked. This is the kind of evidence that I got again and again. I'm going to take notes during my reading. Well, people took pictures of their notes and posted them. My favorite was the student who took a selfie with his notes. And there he is with his book. He was a very creative student. And you can tell with the different colors and fonts and sizes and all that. But he took a selfie of himself with his notes. And that was his evidence that he had taken notes on product design and development. My reflections, um, meeting week three, I really do think helped establish a rapport and helped uh, make it okay for the students to come to my office. Uh, having the students create criteria for their goals, create the rubrics as a group, much higher degree of buy-in. They were much more willing to or seemed to understand the, what was expected of them. My sample, when we were doing the rubric, I had a good uh, goal that said, I'm going to basically read and take notes, and a bad, I'm going to read and take notes. And we compared the two, and um, sure enough, a lot of the smart goals I got were, I'm going to read and take notes. Well, yeah, which is not a bad goal. You know, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, keeping the portfolio off-site, I think, is wonderful. We talked about how to turn it into what's called a uh, show place portfolio or a show-off portfolio or, you know, different names for that. Um, think about having students report at the end of the semester. I, I'm still tossing that up in the air. But truly, overall, I do think it had a positive effect on their engagement. Um, I did have a slightly lower DFW rate, but I'm not sure that that was significant because it was a small set. So that's my uh, spiel, and I'm going to turn it over to Tom and talk about chemistry. <laughs> I'm Tom. I like coming after John because people won't keep telling me I'm dressed up. <laughs> um, so my project was to develop these problem um, sets that's implement on Blackboard that student can practice over and over again. And um, we'll see how it works. Um, OK, so I'll start talking about the motivation for this project, as well as describing what the project is like, and then we'll look at some results. So first, uh, the course I'm targeting is Chem 099. It's a preparatory course for the general chemistry one. And so these students have um, remedial or not college-ready level chemistry. And the idea is to improve the student's performance and their learning. How am I going to evaluate that? I'm not exactly sure if these are valid, but these are the more measurable things I have. First, we'll be looking at their exam score uh, compared to previous semesters, and also um, their final exam score, which is a common campus final. And we have different versions that's given on different um, semesters, but all the same questions, but the choices were switched. So I thought that might be a good evaluation. Um, and then for success, perhaps looking at the DFW rate. So we'll look at that later. My personal goal for my class after the implementation was to first, can I improve their work habits? So that's the first thing I hope to, to do. And then looking at their exam and final uh, scores. So the project is these Blackboard delivered practice problems. And there are small sets, there are uh, problem banks that the student can um, keep practicing and they get different problem combinations each time so they're not memorizing the answer. Um, they're due 
Oh, shoot, sorry. They're due the day before the exam because I want to maximize the impact. There's kind of not as useful if you make them do after the exam. And so they also have unlimited attempts on these problems. So these are very low risk assessments that give them immediate feedbacks as to what did they know, what didn't they know. It tells them which problem they got wrong and what the correct answer is. So they can go either get some help, looking their notes, try to find the correct answer first by themselves and then try again. And the, um, I talked about the question banks and the delivering is on Blackboard so they can attempt it whenever they want with the diverse student body body we have, I thought that would be um, much more uh, useful for the students. Oh, so here's a uh, screenshot of a typical type of problem if it's a calculation type where you can see their variables are standing for x. So they don't just memorize what the answer is, but they need to be able to apply the calculation steps in the correct order as well. Um, some of the metacognitive and um, aspect of it is to uh, I like the first one is so that students who are very strong, they don't have to waste a lot of time doing busy work. They do it once, they get it right, great. They don't lose any points, but it's also allowing students who needs the work and who's willing to put in the time and work to uh, be rewarded. Low stake assessment that the student can use to evaluate themselves and try again. And they can keep practicing this learning cycle of retrieving information and see if they get it right and then do it again and again until they get better at it. All right, let's take a look at the results. So first, effect on student behavior. For the four exams, you can see that most of the time, about 60 to 70% of students try between one to two times. Um, for the first exam in red, there's a lot more higher number of tries that might just be a novelty effect. Hey, this might be something new, or they're trying to get used to the system. And then towards the end, the fourth exam in blue, there's a little bit fewer number who are trying more. And it's because the fourth exam covering materials that's covered in the first three exams, but not putting them together in a more realistic concept. They have to uh, use what they've learned in a more complex problem solving. And so perhaps, I'm guessing, that they just got better at it, could be because of John's project too. They just got really good. Um, and then towards the end of the semester, there are also some students who stopped showing up but never dropped. They're also included. So, um, and then, oh, but in in general, there's no significant lasting effect of I think increasing practice. Perhaps they gave up. Perhaps they just needed to do it once and get the full point, I'm not exactly sure. Um, and then I wanted to look at how does this problem score correlate to their exam score in class, whether it helps them on the exams. So um, most of the, you, what we can see is that if they score 80 or above on the problems, they do pretty well on the exams. And you can see that's throughout uh, the first, four, uh, first three exams. The fourth exam, however, we, can, we see that a lot of students, they don't need to do so well on the problem, problems. They're trying less as well, but they still do pretty well on the, um, on the exam. And uh, I think it's because, again, these are pr the things they have already learned before. They're just putting it together. So how do you do well on problem sets if scoring 80 helps you your exam? How can you do better on these problems? I look at how many times uh, they try. So you can see that if you, the more time you try, the better you get on the problem sets. So perhaps trying more will help them on the problem set, and then that could lead to a better exam score, perhaps. And so if they get at least an 80% on these practice problems, then they have a, a much better chance of doing better on the, um, on the, pro on the in class exams. Okay. Do attempts really lead to higher exam score? Because that seemed to be what I was suggesting. So first exam, these are the grade distribution. The, on the x-axis is the number of attempts that's increased from exam two to exam one. On the y-axis is their score um, change, whether it's increasing or decreasing. 
And so from the second exam to the first exam, we see a lot of students didn't do as well. From the third exam to the second exam, we see a lot more students doing better. If I made a cutoff line at a, a, a improvement of at least 10%, then we can see that there are more students who are doing more practice leading to better results because sometimes a little bit difference may not be significant. So I just randomly pick 10% as something that perhaps is a more of a significant improvement. And then the last, from the fourth exam to the third, to the third exam, um, most students are doing better, not necessarily uh, doing more work and doing a lot more practice, not necessarily leading to better results. I'm not exactly sure, but probably due to the nature of that exam again. Uh, and I only have one of this class the past semester, so it's very limited data set. But it's a good thing to see that in general, students are moving up and to the right because that means they are performing better on the exam and perhaps they're doing, uh, their work is paying off. Final exam comparison. Um, the two fall semesters have very similar final exam average. My spring semester was not so good even though we had uh, the coaches in, embedded in those classes. How about my class? I don't have, uh, oh, this is, are the results from the campus. So I have a lot, more, a lot more people as you can see. And the fall semester in general did better than the spring semester, uh, about on average two problems about 1.2 to 8.4 percent. What about my class? Because the department implement other, um, other things to help improve student performance. How can I parse that out from what I'm trying? So I compare my class for the problem uh, set sections compared to the um, campus-wide result. Um, my section did um, better uh, f uh, on average about or five problems compared to the campus. And if you compare to the uh, previous fall semester, which also had a, a very good performance, it's on average, again, about five problems. So it seemed to suggest on a very limited data uh, points that the student did do better and I'm hoping that in some way might be contributed to these problem sets. And I'd also see a decrease in DFW rate because I think these problems let students know where they stand. They have a better idea of what they know, what they don't know, and they can target what they want to work on. And um, that helps them build their confidence and stay with the class. Conclusion, not really improving student performance. My time is up. Not really improving student performance, but it does seem to improve, uh, not improving student behavior, but it does seem to have some effect on student performance on exams and uh, final in class, as well as decreasing the DFW rate. Moving forward, I wanna think about how, what are the other ways I could implement this and improve it. I uh, wanna thank all these people here and your time, and the people who helped me do the statistical analysis, and these are the references, thank you. My presentation is entitled, Wait, Where's the Lecture? The Impact of Switching the Sequence of Events in the Classroom. So a particular quote from one of the readings um, over the course of um, being engaged in the SET program really inspired me to implement this particular strategy. And the quote is, to be a true learning community, all members must exchange information, ideas, and opinions. If you do not take steps to ensure all students participate, only a few students will speak up while the majority remain quiet, perhaps listening attentively, but just as probably off in their own worlds daydreaming. And that's from Student Engagement Techniques, a handbook for college faculty by Barclay. So what I did in my COM 108 Introduction to Human Communication course was flip the sequence of the typical classroom experience. So instead of coming in and lecturing right off the bat like students expect, I come in with 
some type of activity or thought-provoking question for the students to engage in prior, and then um, we follow up with the lecture afterwards. So initially, I plan to implement this strategy in only three lectures across, um, a throughout, excuse me, throughout the semester, um, what communication is, culture and communication, and relationships and communication. Instead, I did it in almost all of my class meetings where this was applicable. Some of the class meetings are dedicated to um, public speaking speeches and things of that nature, so obviously I wasn't able to implement it on those days. So I started the classes off with a discussion, question, challenge, or activity before I lectured in the hopes that this would prime students' minds for instruction. So I have some examples um, referring back to the three that I just discussed, what is communication? So I started off that particular lecture with this question. What is the purpose of communication in your life? I asked students to take about five or six minutes to jot down an answer to that question, and I asked a few of them to share it to all of us in the class. In the lecture on culture and communication, at this point students had already been arranged in their groups and I asked them to share what their understanding of their culture is to their group mates. And I wanted them to specifically think about music, religion, dress, language, etc. And then in the lecture on relationships and communication, I gave my students a love language test prior to our discussion about um, relationships. And they were able, first we were able to talk about what is a love language. And then they were able to determine what their love language is. And many of them got excited enough to even want an extra copy for their significant others so that they can discuss their love languages and how they can kind of bridge the gap if the two of them have different love languages. So why did I decide to implement this particular strategy? Well, on many days, I felt like at the end of the class period, I was kind of just getting the job done. I was going in and I was lecturing and we were having discussion, sometimes more um, discussion in classes than other times. And then, you know, it was, I hope that they got something out of this. That was how I was leaving the class. And I didn't feel like my students were as vested in the information as I wanted them to be. I find this particular discipline to be so interesting and intriguing, and one of the things I tell my students at the beginning of the semester is that regardless of who you are, where you come from, or what you're planning to do with your lives, something we talk about in this class is going to impact you in some way. I hope that you'll be able to connect with something in, you know, that we talk about over the course of this semester. So I wanted to make that clearer to them with the hopes that, you know, they would go off and make these connections on their own after we met in class. So why do I think, or how do I think that this strategy will foster student success? Well, if we put ourselves in our student's shoes, they're hearing upwards of a dozen or more lectures a semester. How can we expect them to be excited about every single lecture that they attend? We can't put that type of pressure on them. Are we excited every time we step into the classroom? I mean, I'm not all the time. <laughs> so I figured that if, we, if they're initially met with something that is unexpected, it would get them excited to make the connections. They, at least would say, well, what is she up to today? What is she doing? Why is she um, asking us to do this? You know, instead of pulling out their notebooks and a pen and their laptops, you know, they have to sit back and actually think about something. And um, that will catch them off guard in, in an exciting and interesting way, I think. And I hope that this would lend itself for them to want to participate and to feel excited and, and open about participating in the course. So I did a couple of different assessments to see if this strategy worked. The first was a quantitative assessment where I looked at the examination, the first examination in the course, and I also looked at two of the major speeches, the informative speech and the persuasive speech, and I compared the scores from prior semester to fall semester. So luckily, I taught um, two sections at the same exact time and day, um, in the spring of 2018 and in the fall of 2018 because I think that the time of day has an effect on the students. So I wanted to look at 
two course, two class times, two classes that met at the same time and on the same days. So I looked at my Monday, Wednesday at two in the fall of 2018 and compared that to the spring of 2018. And I looked at my Tuesday, Thursday at two and compared um, the fall scores to the spring scores. And in general, overall, the scores shot up. Um, exam one, the scores went up. Um, and in the, on the informative speech and the persuasive speeches, the scores went up as well in general. Another quantitative assessment I did was a very short survey that I handed out, a three question survey where students were asked yes or no pertaining to the three questions. I'll just read the first question. Do you feel more comfortable expressing yourself and or asking questions in front of your classmates in this course earlier in the semester as compared to other courses? And a, a resounding amount of students in both of those sections said yes. I did some loose qualitative observations as well. I looked at the time that it took for the class to become more comfortable disclosing their thoughts and asking questions and talking about their personal experiences. And in general, it seemed to take less time this semester than it did in previous ones. I observed how quickly students engage with me and with each other, and they did so at a quicker pace than they, than they did in previous semesters um, compared to my experience in previous semesters. I also had some informal one-on-one -on -one conversations with certain students, and they said that they felt more comfortable presenting their speeches, and one student, and I quote, said, he felt more free to speak up in this particular class. So it was more comfortable, the climate was more comfortable, and we felt more like a community. Not only did discussion before the lecture increase students' comfort speaking up, but engagement with the material was up as well. I felt that students appeared to be much more interested in the material, and I gauged this based upon how long some of our discussions lasted. I usually plan for, okay, I know this particular chapter may take two class periods to get through thoroughly, but sometimes I had to make adjustments to the course calendar because our discussions went over a few class periods, which I thought was a really good thing. But one thing um, that I will admit was um, something else that I did differently this semester that I felt impacted the culture of the, of the classroom is that I implemented the use of name tents. And I actually got this idea from my colleague John, and um, we started using name tents from the first day of class, and it helped me and the students learn each other's names at a much faster pace. And as we all know, there's power in calling people by their names. And so I felt that that made the culture more relaxed and, and more comfortable as well, which enables students to want to speak up at a faster pace. So some final thoughts. I think that um, active student participation is something that all of us have a concern about and it's on the decline in all colleges and universities. Um, I as an instructor want to put the responsibility on myself to create an environment and to continue to create an environment where they feel, our students feel encouraged to speak up and to feel comfortable doing so. Moving forward, I want to assess the strategy that I'm using and try to implement other strategies across the board. Um, I want to check in during the midterm time and give my own informal survey to find out how students are feeling about some of the strategies that I'm using and just to get a, a general sense of whether or not they feel comfortable with some of the things that we're doing in the class. And one thing I've started doing that I will con continue to do is to take just informal notes for myself to see what's working and what's not working so that I know that you know I can continue doing this or I failed here and need to reassess what I'm doing. Thank you so much for listening. So hi everybody, my name is Kandan Manshi and uh, I'm an instructor in the Department of Engineering, um, Physical and Computer Science. And uh, I'm teaching uh, introductory courses as well as advanced programming courses. And um, one of the challenges in uh, my programming course uh, is that 
uh, the students that come to my class, they are usually, uh, they have usually uh, limited or no prior knowledge. And uh, because of the nature of this course, students do not have the knowledge because uh, they are not taught these subjects in high school. So uh, when they come to class, you know, usually the first two weeks they are very confused. Um, and then the nature of the course requires uh, students to learn programming by just doing. So just, you know, delivering the content to students is not uh, enough. Um, but still, there is theory that they need to learn. So in order to write programs and do activities, they still need to do the theory. But one of the challenges for me in class was that, you know, by the time I was covering the theory, there was not enough time to do activities in class. Um, and then, of course, you know, just do some uh, problem solving. So, um, uh, in spring of uh, 2018, uh, being a set uh, cohort member, uh, we uh, had to develop this strategy that uh, can help students uh, be more successful in their uh, course. And I applied a, a um, strategy that I called Watch, Think, Write, Share. And this strategy consists of uh, four different phases. And uh, the first three phases uh, are supposed to be done before class. Um, the watch phase, think phase, and write phase needs to be done before class. And the last part, which is the share part, is basically the phase that is going to be done during the class. And again, going back to what was my um, basically goal, uh, my goal was to be able to engage students more in class. So this strategy actually gives me more time in class uh, to be able to uh, engage students. So um, I used uh, a tool uh, that uh, Leah mentioned before. Uh, I used a tool uh, in order to implement the first two phases, which is the watch phase and the think phase. And uh, then uh, this uh, tool is called Edpuzzle. And basically Edpuzzle is a software, it's a, um, a tool that is actually um, free. You can find it um, online free and you can just sign up to it and uh, create an account. But uh, this actually helped me to gather all my videos in one place. And as a matter of fact, if you notice, um, you can, um, Okay, you can create classes, different classes, and as you can see, I um, used uh, this uh, tool uh, um, fall last semester, and for this semester, I'm actually uh, creating another class, and uh, you can actually upload uh, your um, videos, and these videos can be found on YouTube, or you can create your own videos, or actually you can find videos uh, from instructors that have used uh, this uh, tool before and they uploaded their videos here. So there are lots of resources that you can find. But the good thing is that you can organize it in folders and you can use it later. Um, and uh, it, this tool has some features. Uh, the, uh, one of the features is that you can crop the video. So if you find that the, the video is uh, really long, you can actually crop it, make it shorter. Um, and as you can see, these two little things here, they actually show that, you know, where is the begin and end of the video. Another feature is that you can um, put your voice, you can uh, just record your voice over the entire video. Um, and that is the uh, feature that is, okay. Okay, so this is the feature voice, voice over. And then you can also add the audio notes um, to the video, as well as questions, the quizzes, which is uh, this part, the quizzes on here. And um, um, when you, so, you know, this is an example of how you can add the quizzes. And as you can see here, uh, you can add the essay questions, uh, the quiz, I mean, when I say quiz, you know, questions. Uh, that the students can answer. So you can add the uh, essay questions, multiple choice questions, as well as, you know, you know just put like a comment on your video. And um, um, uh, 
once you basically add these uh, questions, you can save it, and it's going to appear like this. So these uh, little boxes with the question, question mark are the quizzes that, uh, for example, are in this part of the video. Uh, but the great thing is that, you know, when uh, the video comes to that part, the video pauses and then um, uh, students have to answer the questions and then submit the question in order to see the rest of the video. And this is just an example of a multiple choice question on this video. And um, it's pretty easy, as you can see here. Um, uh, another feature with this tool is that um, it actually lets you to see the progress uh, for the students. Of course, I haven't shown the, uh, you know, the name of the students here, but you can see, you know, who has watched the video, who has not, you know, who has completed, and you can grade students on this. So this is really great. Um, it also has a grade book, so you can see the, you know, the video names, and, uh, you know, if you have, you know, graded the students, you can actually take these results and put it in, uh, on Blackboard easily. Um, so that's another thing. Um, so going back to the strategy that I had, and it had four phases, the first uh, two phases, uh, as I mentioned, uh, are implemented using this tool. Uh, so this is the, uh, the second phase um, that actually after, he, after the students watch the video, they have to think about the video. How do they think about the video by just answering these questions and just you know, look at the result to see if they got the concept or not. So that is really the uh, idea. So uh, that is the second phase. And the third phase, uh, again, these are done before the students come to class. Uh, the third phase is just the th uh, right phase. Uh, so after the students watch the video, after they answer the questions on the video, now they have to write about the key points they learned from the video. Uh, not only that, they have to also create a question, one question, not like many questions, just one question uh, based on the content of the video, and they have to also provide the answer to that question as well. Um, so they create the question, they um, uh, provide the answer, but they have to also upload it to Blackboard. So there's a, a folder I have created on uh, Blackboard that they can upload it, and I can just look at all these questions um, and then just have them all together. So these are the three phases. The last phase is the share phase when they come to class. So they are prepared, um, they have watched these videos, they uh, come with some background knowledge. Now they can actually bring uh, their information and share it in class uh, through the class discussion, um, just like, you know, um, uh, just um, sharing the one question that they created. Uh, we can just discuss about all this. Uh, now, this is a typical activity, class activity, that uh, they do in class. So they come to class, there is like a five minutes short quiz based on uh, the video um, that they uh, have watched. Uh, and these are really short stake uh, quizzes, maybe like, you know, 1% of the total grade. And then uh, it is followed by worksheets, and these worksheets are basically in a way that they have uh, two sections, short answer and then programming question. Short answer basically uh, uh, looks at, you know, how basically um, tests their knowledge and then programming question gives them this um, chance to actually write code and then practice uh, more programming uh, activities. Uh, so this is uh, uh, based on the student survey. Um, after actually, uh, I, I implemented this uh, strategy uh, last semester, as I mentioned, and then I uh, surveyed students on uh, these some of these questions. 90% uh, they said that they watched the videos on time. 75% they said they were confident, confident answering the questions on video. 80% they said it was effective. Uh, and it helped them for class discussions. And um, these are some of the um, highlights of student survey. Uh, some of them thought that there should be more, uh, there should be answers to the programming questions, and some of them, they said that they need more, uh, basically, uh, uh, videos. 
Uh, this is the result of the midterm exam for three different uh, uh, semesters. Uh, there was an increase in the uh, midterm grade in the fall of 2018 compared to the last previous courses. And this is the result of the final exam. There was a big increase, um, but you know, I definitely have to look at the uh, results more uh, for the next semester. Um, and this is basically just a chart of like, you know, comparing midterm and final exam. So that was it. That was, <laughs> thank you. Uh, when I started teaching uh, almost two decades ago, I, uh, not surprisingly, taught the way I had been taught. Uh, mostly lecture with a little discussion sprinkled in. Over the years, I experimented with a lot of different strategies. And after reading the education literature on the benefits of collaborative learning strategies, I, I decided to experiment with the use of student teams. Now I happily place all of my students in permanent student study teams at the beginning of every semester. Now, what I do with my students and how I do it and why I do it, if you're interested, feel free to talk with me uh, after the session. But as I'm sure most of you know, group work doesn't always work. Uh, in fact, uh, it takes uh, a lot of work to get group work to work. And I think that the biggest problem, and probably the reason why John hasn't talked to uh, student in 30 years that wanted to do more group work is what I call the free rider problem. The strongest student does all or most of the work. It's in the interest of the strongest student to do all or most of the work. It's in the interest of the other students to let the strongest <laughs> student do all or most of the work. That's a problem. But don't give up on group work because there's a way to deal with it. The trick is that instructors need to design group or team projects that create positive interdependence among the members of the team or group. Now that's not so easy to do. Positive interdependence has three key features. First one, each student's success must depend on their team success. That's not hard to create. Some part of their grade being a team grade can do that. It's the second part that's harder to create and that gets at this free rider problem. That is that each student's performance has to significantly impact the success of the team. And then there's a third component too that's often missed. And that is the students actually have to work together. They have to collaborate in order to succeed as a team. It's not good enough just to give a project and the student is divided up and each student does their thing and they slap it all together at the end and they turn it in as a team project. Well, it's not. It's really a collection of individual projects. They're not learning from each other and working with each other. So it turns out to be a quite a challenge to develop strategies that incorporate uh, those three features. One that I created years back that I really like, that I use every semester before final exams, it's what I call my exam bowl competition. And uh, I've got a handout on that for those who are interested. Some other instructors at other disciplines have adopted their own versions of my exam bowl. You can read it yourself. But uh, in short, what I do is I develop a list of thought-provoking questions, which I ask of my various teams during exam bowl competition day. The trick is, when I ask a team a question, they can't pick the spokesperson. I pick the spokesperson randomly, okay? And their teammates cannot help the spokesperson during the competition. So that means that the teammates have to help each other, teach each other everything they know before the competition. The student may know all the answers but still lose because that student may never be called on. So they have an incentive to teach the rest of their students on their team everything that they know. And so, this creates that positive interdependence, and I've, I've run this for 
for many semesters, and I'm very happy with it, but it does take a whole class period, and I've only been doing it before the final exam. So last semester, I wanted to develop some new strategies that create this positive interdependence and get students teaching each other uh, that I could use earlier in the semester, maybe before my first and second exams. And so this is what I came up with. Before the first exam, I came up with this idea. Teams could earn bonuses if they had the highest, lowest team member score. So teams that, that had the, on their team, the highest, lowest score on the first exam would get bonus points to be added to their first exam score. So that means students had incentive to help their teammates, to teach their teammates everything they know, because if one teammate failed, the whole team would fail. And this would also be a DFW reduction strategy, too, because most of the effort is focused on students who may be struggling. Did it work? Well, um, I think so, but the jury's still out. Um, I did require all students in this class to participate. Most did. Uh, of those that did, there were 16 of them did, seven did not. They scored substantially higher than the students that did not participate. It's eight and a half points higher on the exam. Um, but that could have been the result of selection bias. It could be the students that didn't participate or just not as motivated. They wouldn't have done as well anyway. Don't know. I also set up a control class. This was an 11 a.m. class. I also had a 12.30 class that I did not. I gave the same exam, but did not do this challenge. And they did almost as well as the participating students in the 11 a.m. class. But I learned later that uh, those students were stronger on other assignments as well, so I, I'm not sure that was a fair comparison. But one thing I did, in addition to running the exercises, is I surveyed my students after they had taken their tests. And I was very surprised that 16 out of 16 students, every student that participated, said that they enjoyed the process, they liked the team exercise of trying to achieve a goal, that they at least thought that they learned something from the experience, <laughs> and that they were ready for any more challenges I could throw at them. So before the second test, I threw something else at it. This one was based on improvement. So the idea here is teams would get a bonus only if every member of the team scored at least as high on the second test as they scored on the first test. Again, this incentivizes students to help their teammates, to teach them what they know, because every teammate had to succeed in order for uh, any student to get a bonus. Did it work? Well, uh, I really think this one sure did. Um, my second tests tend to be more difficult than my first test. Nevertheless, in this class, 11 students scored higher on the second test and only five scored lower. Contrast that with the 1230 class where I didn't do this challenge. And the result was just the opposite. Yeah. Only four students did better, 11 did worse. Um, and so this is pretty good evidence <laughs> that um, this type of strategy um, increases interest in performance. Conclusions? Well, um, I think that I've provided some evidence that these kinds of assignments that generate positive interdependence, incentivize students to teach each other what they know, to help each other, to help motivate each other, and I think generate more learning. Um, but uh, this is a small sample size, right? Only one semester. I'd like to run this for several semesters before I draw any conclusions about the academic effectiveness of these strategies. Um, though I was particularly impressed by the finding that students seem to really enjoy the challenge 
of attempting to achieve a goal as a team, much like college sports teams do. And it was also notable that they all at least think they learned something from the experience. And I think they did too. Thanks. Um, I know we have limited time for, thank you, for, <laughs> for the rest of the presentation, so I'm going to try and go through this quickly. Um, as you can see from the title, I'm going to talk about something that might generate some controversy, and I like good kind of controversy, so finger crossed. Um, I want to start with a question, and my question is, when we um, hear someone say in public, um, admonish another person, say, speak English, you're in America, we are appalled, right? Or at least we should be. Yeah. <laughs> and yet, in our own college classrooms here in the US, we tell our students, this is an American class, speak English only, or some variation of that. My question is, why? Why should voicing English proficiency be equal to silencing another language? Why should acquiring English proficiency be equal to giving up the ownership over other languages? And why should English proficiency be equal to language X, Y, and or Z deficiency? So why do I ask this question? Because as you might tell, I'm from India. I grew up in a place which is multilingual, multicultural, sometimes crazily so. When I first came to the US to pursue higher education in 2004, I was repeatedly given the impression directly and indirectly by the people around me here in this country that um, the US was a monolingual country. And because I came from a different place, I didn't really buy into that. And I realized that no, the US, <laughs> this country is very multilingual and very multicultural. And maybe it's because in the last couple of decades, this country has been changing so rapidly. So this is backed by data. If you look at the graph on the screen, um, the US landscape is changing. It's becoming more visibly, and I would say audibly, multilingual and multicultural. So this is, this is from um, a news article that was published recently. There's a growing linguistic diversity in the US. In 1980, when this data was collected, the number, the percentage of people, the US residents over age five, who spoke a language other than English at home was far lower. Now, as recent as 2016, it was 21.6%. That means more than one in five person that you know in this country speaks a language other than English at home. US citizens age 18 or older, 15.3% people, according to this poll, speak a language other than English at home. And other than English does not mean they don't speak English at home. It means that they speak at least another language at home, maybe in addition to English. Um, and yet, despite this linguistic diversity in our classrooms, those languages tend to be silent. And I would argue that they are silenced. Why? So that was my question. Now, I want to talk about community colleges specifically. Um, historically, community colleges like Montgomery College have been serving the community. They've been attracting minority students. More recently, they've also been attracting immigrant and international students, and I would also say faculty and staff. Um, and these are among the most diverse higher education settings in the US. Therefore, our goals need to evolve. They need to change. We are working, living, and surviving in a globalized world. In order to make sure that our students survive and thrive, we have to make sure that they are translingual. This is a term that I use, which means they should be able to use codes from different languages in contextually appropriate ways. For example, I'm being translingual right now. I can speak more than one language, but I'm speaking the common language in this room, English. But if I were speaking to Dr. Sanjay Rai, if he were in the room, and it was just the two of us having a conversation, we might be switching back and forth between English and Hindi. So that's translingual. We need to make sure our students are interculturally competent. That means that they can recognize and navigate cultural boundaries successfully, and that they can demonstrate global competences. According to Asia society, that means that students can investigate the world, recognize and weigh perspectives, communicate ideas, and take action. And I just want to emphasize that Montgomery College in particular is a very, very diverse college. 
How do I know that? Here's an example. This is from IIE, the Institute of International Education. They collect data about international students every year from around the country. According to their site, Montgomery College was number six last year in the number of international students who come here to study. That's pretty amazing. This is from Montgomery College's own website. I call it a super diverse context. According to the Chronicle of Higher Education last year, Montgomery College was racially and ethnically the most diverse community college in continental US. The top five or six above Montgomery College were all in Hawaii. Um, and you can see this is from Montgomery College at a glance. You can search for this document on the, course, on the college website. You can see the diversity of the students in terms of ethnicity as well as residency status. And if that's not enough, according to Community College Review, Montgomery College has a diversity score of 0 0.78, which is higher than any other community college in Maryland. You can, so you can see the blue line is Montgomery College, the red line is are the rest of the community colleges in this state. So let's talk about translingually responsive pedagogy. Now, I did not choose a strategy for my project in this program. Uh, part of it is because I have um, a research background, a practitioner research background, and I've been theorizing about this. I call it translingually responsive pedagogy. So I used the opportunity last year to actually go deeper into this theorizing that I'm doing. So because we have limited time, um, I'm going to focus on three aspects. One, when I say TRP, um, it focuses on communicative competence, not replacement of one language or language variety with another language or language variety. So I am not teaching my students how to speak like an American. I am not reducing their accent. I am not replacing their accent. I don't speak with an American accent, but I think I'm proficient in English. So I expect my students to be able to do that too. So I try to do that without denigrating, devaluing anybody's language or language variety. So I do realize that linguistic contexts are inequitable, especially in academic settings, which means standard English is considered more important in a college setting. So I know it is important to teach all students the code of what is valued as standard and correct in academic settings, but to do so in a way that doesn't discriminate or devalue who our students are. Um, another way to make sense of TRP is to think about English as a pluricentric language, which means English has many centers around the world. There are many standard Englishes. There are also variations in English language codes, histories, and cultures. Think about black English, for example. We have standard American English, then we have African American English. Both are Englishes, and both are equally valid and viable. So another aspect of TRP is that it challenges linguicism. And what is linguicism? Just like racism, linguicism is discrimination based on language and the idea that a language variety is more correct or more important than another. So my example of African American English versus standard English, but because I teach academic English in the ELAP program here, and I work a lot with immigrant students, um, um, who speak other languages, I'll also give the example of English versus Spanish. So the use of any language should feel like a choice, not an imposition. For me, that's the, that's the meaning of freedom. So what does it look like in the classroom? Theory is good, but how do you actually apply it in the classroom? I have three examples here. One, I raise my students' awareness of language use. So I talk about variations within English. I tell them, there's a word aluminum, but there's also another word aluminium, and both are correct. Half of the world says aluminum, the other half says aluminium, and they can still talk to each other and make sense. Um, I talk about ways of organizing information, which are often culturally diverse. For example, in the Western context here, especially in the US, students need to know how to organize information using linear logic, from general to specific, from most important to less important, from main, major to minor, and so forth. But in other cultures, we don't use that logic. In other cultures, we talk about using a more circular logic where you lead your audience up to your thesis. It's considered presumptuous if you just right away give your thesis or your main idea. Right, so I also plan classroom conversations. I encourage students to use all languages responsibly. So what that means is I facilitate inclusive communication 
when working in small groups. Where's Bruce? So working in small groups. So when I uh, give my students small group activities, sometimes I group them according to common language. So if three of my students are francophone, you know, they come from French speaking backgrounds, I'll put them in a small group together. And I tell them, you're allowed to use French as well as, as English. Know that the final output has to be in academic English. And they figure it out. What happens is as a result, there's a natural shift from a common home language to the target language. And it doesn't feel imposed upon. It feels like a choice for them. I also design my course assignments that brings out students' identity, their background. For example, I ask them what home means to them. And they also do presentations where they can bring in information from their background. Now, I know I'm out of time, so I'm just going to go over this very, very quickly. The impact, it builds students' confidence. It engages students in the learning and acquisition of academic English more deeply. And it prepares students for global realities. It builds upon their global competence. So next steps, what's the outcome or the assessment of that? I'm actually working on a textbook right now, which is going to be a complement to the course site. Um, this is the work in progress cover. Um, I'm using a, a free website called Press Books. So once the textbook is complete, hopefully by the end of summer, it will be open access, which means students would not have to pay a cent to uh, use this textbook. They'll be able to download it in different formats. And my colleagues would be also be able to use this textbook and adapt it to their own pedagogical contexts. Thank you. <laughs> You're still here. Um, so thanks for being here. Um, yeah, thanks for coming. <laughs> Um, my name is Jennifer Lee. I teach English composition at the Tacoma Park campus. Um, and I'm excited to be here. So I'm going to just get started. Um, English 101 and English 101A, um, and together with English 102, are the two required composition courses that you need to conquer before you can move on past Montgomery College. And so what I find is that English 101, Every semester, students come in and they bring a lot of baggage, um, more so than other classes, I think, maybe comparable to math, where they have deeply embedded just ideas of whether they're good writers, whether they can ever be good writers, um, whether they're good students. And these were given to them um, by other teachers, other classroom experiences. Um, and they bring that with them from the beginning. Um, there's other issues. There's questions about, you know, when am I going to use this, right? Um, and concerns about whether, um, if, since this isn't their native language, just a hyper concern about their deficiencies, um, as they have been told, um, which a lot of times leads to a hyper obsession with grammar and usage. Like they think that's the key, that's the key to success. Um, Fear of word counts, I show them the syllabus on the first day and they will nearly faint at the idea of producing that much, that much content, those many pages. Um, and then the real problems of the world, they work jobs, they have kids, um, they're just tired. So I can talk about motivation, but they're human. And so they come after working double shifts and having to go home to their kids. But they're here, so I'm trying to make the most out of the time that they are allowing me to have with them. So all that stuff, just there's lots of anxiety all around. Right? So that's what the beginning of English looks like. Um, they consider that they are either writers or they're not. Um, most students will say that they are not. And then I try to show them that they are that they're already writing. Not the kind of writing that I'm going to show them, maybe, but they are already using rhetorical strategies every day. And so they're already doing it. So that's where class usually starts. The thing that is hardest for them to understand is that it's supposed to suck. Like, nobody writes great from the beginning. The first thing that we read as a class is uh, an essay by um, Anne Lamott called Shitty First Drafts. And it's the, the idea of a published author just talking about how she doesn't want to get hit by a bus before she finishes a draft because someone might find it and be like, that's how you write, right? And so the idea that it's supposed to suck and it's the engaging in the process of sucking and improving, that wh that's why we're here. So that said, my goal is to boost their belief that they can do that. 
right? And what has been happening is that that moment of, oh, I can do that, is coming really late in the semester. Usually when we're doing the research paper, which is weeks before the end of the class. And so that aha moment after they've produced those pages, like, look what I did, right? And this belief that, oh, I was always capable of doing that. But then when that happens weeks before the final portfolio is done, there's no more time. We can't engage in that process more. And then that just means that they had like 10 weeks where they were just struggling and just thinking horrible thoughts about themselves, right? And so my goal is to try to move that moment of realization earlier on in the semester. Um, getting them to realize that drafting and revising and that recursive process that all English teachers teach, um, that it can happen for the whole of the semester. So the, here's one. There were two prongs to my strategy. Um, I wanted to provide an opportunity for them to get feedback without a grade early on in the semester and try and change things up. Um, some of the best practices of providing feedback, um, conferences, you know, notes in the margins, um, paragraphs written to them. Um, I've done all of that. The way that I've tried to do it this past couple of semesters is through uh, an app, through a program called Clip. It's audio recording. It's an easy way for me to record my voice looking over their paper and then sending them the link. And so what I try to do there is it's easier in that situation to not fall in, like, you know, my handwriting doesn't like disintegrate into nothing when it's paper 50 as opposed to the first one. Um, I try, always have tried to lead with positive, right? But then when you get pressed for time, like that's just, you know, that's the first thing to go. Um, and so what I try to do is I would make a recording and I start off with, hi, Nydia. I enjoyed so much reading your story and learning about your grandmother. I mean, you, no matter what the paper, you can find two things to say. It can be about, I love how much it's changed from your first draft. It can be how you enjoyed just some part of it. It doesn't have to be like, your use of grammar was astonishing. Um, it doesn't have to be that. And so everybody gets a feedback via this like link, right? And then there's no misunderstanding of my tone. Because I sound like this. I'm like, oh my goodness, that was so fun to read. I love how you, it's obvious that you put in work since the first time that I saw this. Something like that. And then it lends itself to a narrative style where I have to make like one connected point as I'm reading. It's not scattered marks in the margins. Um, and it forces me to focus not on grammar errors, but more about critical thinking ideas, main ideas, and supports and all that. This is a screenshot of what it looks like on the desktop. I have the app for it. It's all free as long as you um, don't go over like some amount of memory. And so I press the button and I start talking. I can do it anywhere. And so it's, it's for me, so much more enjoyable than sitting with a pen. And so every student, and this is like my collection of them, and so not, they're not all this long. Um, Okay, so then, they're not all this long, but what I found is that they, it's, maybe it's just because something new, they listen to it a lot. And then the benefit, about, um, the benefit of that over conferencing is that when you conference, I don't know the student yet, I sit them like two feet away from me, I'm talking and I'm talking, and do you know what they do? They nod. They nod and they say, oh, yes, yes, yes. But then I, I might make some notes. They might try to keep up with what I'm saying and take some notes. They walk away, and maybe 70% of it is just evaporated. So it's not that they don't want to, but it's just gone, right? And so this way, students have it in their possession, and it's up to them what they do with it. I'll talk about what I found as a result of it after. The second part of it is giving students examples of what writing looks like. At first, I was going to give them sample papers from other semesters, but I decided to give them opportunities to see other students in the class, like their assignments in process. And so what that has looked like for me in the past is this. This is an ideal. Um, so you know, I would like divide it up. They would work. They would try to put it up. It's messy. It's messy. Um, so what I have done is there are lots of 
group brainstorming tools online. You just have to Google it. Um, there's Padlet. There's I'll show you a Poplet. You can use Google Docs if you want. I think there's iBrainstorm. Lots of lots of great tools where it's just a matter of you share a link and students can just contribute. So you can work in small groups. You can do individually. Um, and then it gives us the opportunity to see this. So the mini outline, which is like a thesis and just the main topic sentences. Um, you throw it up there, you don't, we don't know who wrote what. And so it's anonymous, there's no pressure. Um, you can share, and we're gonna talk about these like individually, I'm gonna ask students to like point out things that aren't working, point out things that they like. And we, if you wanna volunteer that it's your work, you can, but you don't have to. And so these are, I'm just giving you some like images of um, Padlet that I've, that my classes this semester have produced. And then this is another kind of, there's different ways that you can lay it out. And this is a poplet. So it's, uh, there's more flexibility with the way that you like create the visual for it. And then this is a peer, a guided peer review, which is essentially a list of all the questions and issues that I find as I'm grading. And so it's not just, oh, I really like this paper, or your idea was creative, but they have actual things to say, and then it has produced good results. So I'm running out of time. Uh, my initial plan for assessing, obviously, is what they have to say about their experience and the grade. What happened? Um, the audio feedback, the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. Students loved it. And I can go back and see how many times it's been listened to. And so it varied. Some listened to like four or seven times. Most listened to about two to three times. And then most importantly, the changes from draft to final, amazing. Like you can see the things that they did that you told them to do. Um, and then several students um, from that, that first submission where I was just like, oh, this is what you did, right? To myself, I said that to myself. Um, that there was a tremendous like, trajectory of change that was possible. And I think some of it had to do with the fact that um, we were able to build kind of rapport from the beginning. But no, we're, we're, we weren't even in the same room. Um, and I'm gonna go um, talk about that. I'm gonna wrap up though. Um, so the grades were better, people, students were engaging with all the resources, online tutoring tools. They flooded the writing center like all throughout the semester. Student responses to audio feedback. So the, I took a little survey. And so people talked about how, I love how I'm able to listen to it again and again. Um, they talked about that we were having a conversation, that it felt like a conversation when it's actually less of a conversation than the conversation that would have taken place in conference. And I think it's because it el eliminates the pressure of being actually with me early on in the semester. And then just ease of use, um, that they like the feedback, they like the mode through which they got it. And then uh, trends and grades. So the classes that I was gonna um, compare is fall of 2018, this past one, and then fall of 2017 because they were both 101A sections um, that met Saturday during the day. But then I threw in spring and summer because those happened um, in between, and those are 101s, but they also happened on Saturday mornings. And so if you see, there was a tremendous change. Um, I understand that this is limited um, data, um, but there were, I don't think I lost, I think one student just stopped showing up, um, but th there were, so many more A's, B's, lots of B's, um, good number of C's, um, and so there was a marked improvement in grades. Um, did I, I think that's all I wanted to say. So overall, I was really happy with how it happened, the, the, um, the connections and the ability to see them taking ownership of their own process, like looking to you know, use the, utilize the resources that are out there. And then they were seeing that kind of aha moment earlier on in the semester. And so there are tweaks to be made, um, but I was really happy with um, kind of the analysis of data that I had at the end of the semester. Thank you. Everybody. My name is Jojo Dong. I teach math here, and um, just be prepared. There's going to be a quiz during my presentation, so I hope you were paying attention to Dr. Hanstead earlier today. All right. So, 
Oh, well, I guess uh, I should mention that I'm going to be talking about how I taught metacognitive learning strategies in my calculus class this past semester in the fall. Okay, so teaching students metacognitive learning strategies, uh, three points. First, why did I do it? Second, how did I do it? And lastly, I'm hoping I'll run out of time before this one. Did students benefit <laughs> from it? Um, so let's uh, get started. So the first question of why, and I think you know what Jennifer just said about English 101, right, applies to math classes too, because, well, how many people took math class in college here? Everybody, right? Nobody gets out of college without taking math. So I teach mostly calculus, and so the problem is calculus classes have high DFW rates, right? And, um, and many students in those classes, right, that, that I've been noticing since I've been teaching here at Montgomery College is that they really lack study skills, right? It's not so much that they are incompetent in their math as in they're incompetent in just how to learn, how to study. Um, because actually, I think Dr. Hanstead's not here anymore, but I learned that math is a tame problem. Mathematics is not wicked. Right? Like, if you think about math problems, they're very well defined. They have nice, clean, beautiful solutions, right? They're tame. So math should not be difficult for our students if they just knew how to learn it, right? So um, unfortunately, though, at least here at Montgomery College, uh, our study skills courses taught by our counselors are generally not covered under financial aid. So they don't take those classes, right? The classes that they need, they can't take it. So I decided, well, hey, I'm going to teach it in my math class because guess what? They are required to take the math class and financial aid pays for it, right? So in my calculus class, I had some goals for teaching this. I wanted to help the students be more successful in my calculus classes, uh, but also help them to be more successful in all of their classes, right? Like John's uh, smart goals and all that helped his students be successful in their other classes and you know I set my sights real high like lifelong learning they should be able to do that okay and so luckily I'm not the only one who thinks this way and some um, you know other people back up this kind of thinking so one of the texts we read in set last year was creating significant learning experiences um, and so from this book uh, Fink presents these two options, right? One option is you just include lots of content, right? You just teach them lots of stuff, okay? But he said, well, what, what's going to happen? Well, the students end up neither caring about what you're trying to teach them or wanting to keep learning, right? They just get crammed with all this stuff, which is actually what a lot of people think math is, is just memorizing all the formulas, right? And so... And you know, what are the chances they're going to keep learning this stuff, right? What are the chances that they get inspired? How many of you were inspired in your math class? Oh, good. <laughs> I'll have to talk to you then. Um, you know, but, but he says, well, think about consider option two, right? Consider option two. Take the long-term view. What if we stop trying to cover all the content, right? What if we get our students to care about their learning, right? Care about what they're learning. And, you know, he answers the question, well, it seems much likelier that they will keep, right, what, uh, what they've learned and also keep want to, wanting to keep learning, right? So uh, here's the quiz. The need to create wicked students, right? Uh, I did not coordinate this with Dr. Hanstead, but uh, here's your quiz, okay? So do you remember the reasons he gave for why we need to create wicked students? Will be dead. Hmm? Uh huh. Well, I I'll give you the first one. Students don't always go into the fields they study, right? What else did he say? They don't stay or get the jobs they want. Mm hmm. They don't stay in the fields they start in. Yeah, anything else? Yeah, yeah. Or they don't stay in the same positions. Okay, what else? Exactly, the workplace isn't just, right, English, psychology, math, bio, whatever, right? Okay, what was the solution he suggested? 
Uh huh. And how did he say we should do that? Do you remember? All right, I'll give you the first one for free. There's content knowledge plus skills plus authority. authority. Yay. Okay, everybody gets an A. So, um, right, so this is also what motivated me to teach cognitive strategies in my math classes because, hey, math is a tame subject. So I'm not going to right, get them to become wicked students just doing math with them. I need to give them something more. And so how did I do this? Well, um, I really mainly did this through three different um, documents I created. The first one was my math class primer. So this is a document I wrote. Um, it's kind of been on, you know, I've been drafting it for quite a while now, but basically it outlines my teaching philosophy. I send this out to the students um, a week before classes start and I say, you need to read this because this is why I teach and it explains how I teach. And if you understand that about me and you want to learn from me, then take my class. If that's not how you want to learn, you should probably switch to another section, right? Because I feel like when we teach, it's a journey we have to take together with the students. And if they don't buy into what you're selling, it's not gonna happen, okay? So, um, and uh, so the main document that I'm gonna talk about, which I created for SET, is this Tips for Math Success uh, document, which I will go over in more detail. And the third document is a valediction to my math class, which I share with them at the end of the semester in the hopes of you know, pushing them along with that lifelong learning goal. Okay? And um, I think when this is posted online, you'll be able to click on all three and look at all, all these things. Okay, so the um, tips uh, I'm gonna talk about um, mostly came from this book, uh, which was another book we used for our uh, set last year was um, Teach Students How to Learn right, from uh, Sandra Maguire. I think most of you are probably familiar, familiar with this book already. Um, I also borrowed materials from other colleagues, some here at MC, you know, some not, but um, uh, Tom, didn't you just say all great, all great professors are thieves? Yeah. Okay, and uh, created my, some of my own materials I created. And basically, I just introduced tips throughout the semester, you know, and uh, I would discuss them in class for 15 to 30 minutes. And um, here's what they were. Um, think about your learning. This was just the introduction to metacognition, right, just to get them aware of this concept. Uh, I also teach my class as a flipped model, so it was really important that I put this in the beginning so they understand what a flipped classroom is and how that fits with their learning. Uh, number three, I talked about Bloom's taxonomy. I feel like this is like the secret that we as teachers know, but we don't tell our students. And um, I talked about follow the study cycle, learn to read math, learn to self-assess. This is kind of like the, what we would traditionally think about as study skills, right? Um, and then there's build good habits. Uh, don't do it alone, right, get help. Uh, know your learning style preferences and check your motivation and attitude. Um, and lastly was develop a growth mindset. This I do towards the end of the semester to kind of push them to you know, continue learning and growing. Um, all right, so I'm almost out of time, so I will just go over it really quickly with, uh, you know, did they benefit from it, right? Uh, so I conducted two surveys, one at the mid-semester and one at the end-semester. Both of them were administered online via Google Forms, anonymous. Uh, the mid-semester one was after midterms and they had already seen their midterm grades. Um, the final one at the end of the semester was during final exam week, obviously before they've seen their grades, because otherwise they would have been gone, right? <laughs> Nobody's around after final exam week. Um, and so during the mid-semester survey, there were nine students who responded, and the end of the semester, five students who responded. Um, and so here's you know, some responses I got was from the mid-semester survey um, of the nine students, most of them had heard about metacognition, but a couple of them didn't. And um, this one, I guess, is the most interesting data I got. Uh, of the tips that I had covered by mid-semester, I'd asked them, you know, did you find each one helpful, right? And so you can see that uh, Bloom's taxonomy, everybody found at least somewhat very helpful. And I thought, 
wow, I should totally be talking about that, right? Nobody said it wasn't helpful. And uh, follow the study cycle. Wow, they don't know how to study, and yet they've been through 12 years of school already. But, you know, so, um, Anyway, so the rest of this is not as interesting, just some um, open-ended questions. Um, you know, has it changed the way you think and how? Eh, not really. <laughs> I've used some before, you know, so others seemed obvious. Um, you know, has it changed the way you behave or act? And uh, this person said, I was able to restructure my method of studying for all my classes. Wow, this is like, right, the answer John got. Like, it works for other classes too. Really? <laughs> so. Uh, and at the end of the semester, I asked them, well, should I keep doing this in my class, right? Because some students might be like, well, just teach us more math, right? We don't want to know about it. But, um, you know, four out of the five students he answered uh, all said, you know, yes, you should keep doing it, even though one person said it was only just somewhat helpful for me, but you should do it for other people. <laughs> so um, the last slide is about grades. It's not really, uh, because mostly I think the grades in my class are affected by my grading method, which is a whole nother story, so ask me about that sometime, because like Dr. Hanstead, I'm not into rubrics. So I do standard-based grading. It's a completely different presentation. Ask me about that if you want to know about standard-based grading. Okay, so thank you. I'm done. My name is Raluca Teodorescu and I implemented self-reflections in the Physics 203 course as part of the SET program. This course is an algebra-based physics course that focuses on motion. Students are non-science majors, about 24 in the classroom, and I implemented self-reflections in two sections of this course in, uh, last semester in fall 2018. Um, I must say that before SET started, I did a lot of work on the course, and I designed it as a collection of about 200 problems, conceptual questions, hands-on activities that I categorize according to taxonomies of thinking and uh, offer to students in learning progressions in a way in which as the semester go, uh, went on, uh, the students have been exposed to uh, tasks of increasing think thinking complexity, but one bit at a time. So this led to low DFW rates and good students' performance. And uh, with the help of self-reflections, I really wanted to look more into the, this kind of data. So I used anonymous self-reflections, I addressed them after each classroom, and I didn't offer any incentives to try to uh, get uh, uh, as uh, much feedback, uh, not biased, uh, as I could. Um, it's, it is important to mention that in the beginning of the course, in the first week, I uh, explained to students a learning cycle that I developed based on student-related data, uh, a learning cycle that is supposed to make them successful. Before the classroom, I tell them that they have to read and annotate the formula sheet. In the classroom, they have to complete all the tasks, uh, make sure they check their answers, they explain it to one colleague, and after the classroom, they have to read the chapter summary that they prepare, they have to uh, redo the slides and then do the homework and then give themselves a time, time the exam from everything we've learned. Um, now, uh, as I said, even uh, I followed the same learning cycle and I discussed it in the first week of classes uh, last semester, but then I followed with self-reflections. Some of them uh, focused on performance, mostly in the beginning of the semester, but then I asked about studying habits, content understanding, course format, uh, performance again towards the end, and in the last self-reflections, uh, in the last self-reflection I asked the students uh, if they learned something. It is important maybe to mention here that whenever I offered those self-reflections, I, I explained to students that they are for my learning, for my understanding, for me to help to change the course, until the very last one when I asked about them. Um, the, in the past, uh, about uh, four semesters before the uh, said program started, the DFW rates were really just one or two students out of 24 dropping the course, and this was the case for uh, the two sections last semester as well. 
Regarding the performance, I uh, did here uh, the class average over four semesters for each of the exams. And uh, you see it's mostly in the A and B uh, region. Now, with a caveat, because I don't use uh, uh, the same exam, so the quantity is slightly the same, but the exams are not. Uh, the same, pretty much the same within the standard deviation was the situation in uh, fall 2018 as, as well. So I would say, Students perform well, but uh, with the help of self-reflections, I wanted to understand this performance better. Uh, so I asked in some self-reflections, did you guess on the exams? And I asked after each exam, and uh, after each exam they said yes. <laughs> to give you an idea about how many, this is, for instance, the exam two in section one, about, uh, sorry, in, in section one, about 90% uh, of the students answered the question, and pretty much all of them said, uh, I mean, that said that they yes. In section two, about 67 answered, and a significant uh, percent said that they yes too. Now, this is not too worrisome because they actually, looking at more data, I realize that they guess on one or two problems out of 10. And it's an educated guess because you see the exams are good, so uh, they still know something. But this showed me that good performance does not necessarily mean deep understanding. And I really aim for both <laughs> in my classes. So uh, after this experience, I really try to test for both or collect uh, data for both. I wanted to document a little bit more and figure out if I can find out why they guess. So in other self-reflections, I asked them, how did you prepare for the exam? And this is, for instance, the data for uh, quiz number two, in which the green um, uh, area there 13, shows that 13% of the students follow the learning cycle that I mentioned. And the largest percent, 51% orange area, actually review the slides and the homework once. Uh, this is data for one section, but the second section looks pretty similar. Again, green area, 16% of the students only follow the learning cycle that I suggest. 31% orange area, the highest percent, review the homework and the slides once. So I think the students learn the content, but they do not build confidence, or they do not become confident enough to actually trust all their uh, answers. Um, I, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, uh, re reflections uh, targeted various um, aspects, so I got a lot of data and I learned a lot from it. I cannot present it here due to the lack of time. But it's not only uh, me who learned from this, I think students also learned something because in the last self-reflections, I asked them, list two things that you learned about yourself uh, while you completed these self-reflections for me. And I uh, managed to group the students' answers in categories, and I'm going to use uh, students' words to actually illustrate the categories. Uh, in section one, they said, I learned that I have to go over the content multiple times, spend more time studying, pay more attention to my math, and ask for, to, for help whenever I'm stuck. So I would say, they, it, it shows some change in student habits of learning. Uh, in section two, I got a more variety of the answers, um, but they, uh, they were still along the same lines. Uh, they said that I have to manage my time wisely, make sure I extract the information carefully from the problem before I answer it, review constantly, review the content multiple times, follow the learning cycle that you provided, take notes more carefully, and not be afraid of exams. Um, so again, I, f I feel that the students changed in, in a good direction as well in the section two. Uh, um, and I must uh, mention that the sections were very different. Um, in retrospect, I think from, uh, I learned a lot from self-reflections and uh, I have a lot of class time in this course, but I also have a lot of content to cover. So I couldn't uh, use class time for anything else. We five or 10 minutes, this is what I used here and there in the classroom. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, in the future, I want to look carefully at all the data that I mentioned and uh, uh, detail uh, the aspects um, more in depth, for instance, regarding guessing, I want to look at the characteristics of the problems uh, on which students guess. Maybe I can address something in the classroom. 
But uh, overall, I want to continue the wonderful learning experience that uh, I had in, uh, in the SET program. And it's not only me. You may see uh, my colleagues also enjoyed it very much. So we want to thank Joanne, uh, thank our chairs, our deans, who, uh, and Dr. Rai, uh, who really made this possible for us. Thank you. Thank you.